Coming up next on C-SPAN, today's House Rules Committee hearing on the proposed October surprise investigation. The committee is preparing a task force to look into allegations that members of the 1980 campaign staff of Ronald Reagan held secret negotiations with the government of Iran. Gary Sick, a member of the National Security Council during the Carter administration, has claimed that staffers from the Reagan campaign worked to ensure that Iran would not release the Americans held in the Tehran embassy until after the presidential election. This is the second Rules Committee hearing on the October Surprise Task Force. The committee met today to hear from officials of the Congress's General Accounting Office, which conducted a previous investigation of the charges. We'll now bring you that hearing, chaired by Congressman Joe Moakley, a Democrat from Massachusetts. The uh, Committee on Rules will almost come to order. Where is everybody? <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, I'm sorry. Here. Rules Committee will now come to order. The matter before the Committee this morning is H. Res. 258, creating, uh, Committee on Rules, creating a task force of members in the Foreign Affairs Committee to investigate certain allegations concerning the holding of Americans as hostages by Iran in 1980. Pursuant to House Rule 11, Clause 2J1, the minority members of the Committee on Rules have requested this additional hearing relating to House Resolution 258, creating a task force to investigate allegations that the 1980 Reagan presidential campaign was involved in efforts to delay the release of the American hostages in Iran. The minority members have requested Ms. Barbara Cart and Ms. Cecilia Porter from the Office of Special Investigations of the General Accounting Office, and Mr. Frank Askin, a consultant to the Committee on Government Operations, Subcommittee on Legislation and National Security, to appear before this committee today. The minority members assert that these witnesses have already looked into the allegations concerning a possible deal to delay the release of hostages struck by the 1980 Reagan-Bush campaign organization. The Rules Committee's jurisdictional interest in House Resolution 258 relates to its authority to both report a measure providing for the creation of a special task force and to bestow upon it certain powers necessary to conduct a thorough investigation. In light of this jurisdictional interest, I recognize that questions regarding the necessity of the task force or even the investigation itself are pertinent, if not unavoidable. While it is not my goal to limit the line of questioning, any of our committee members might chose to pursue. I will urge members to confine their questions to what is relevant, uh, questions relating to the nature of the investigation, for example, the scope, thoroughness, and conclusiveness of the work conducted by these witnesses are certainly relevant. But let me take this opportunity to thank today's witnesses for so graciously accepting the minority's invitation to appear before the Rules Committee. It is the committee's hope that your testimony will assist us in determining whether further investigation into these very serious and disturbing allegations is warranted. At this time, I'd like to introduce my minority member, the Honorable Gerald Solomon, New York. Before I start, Jerry, there's been a, a, a request to have still photographers in here. Any objection? No objection. Mr. Chairman, uh, before we start the hearing, which was requested by uh, we minority members pursuant to our right under House rules. Let me, uh, if I might, ask whether one of the witnesses we requested, Mr. Frank Askin, uh, will be testifying? Uh, you, you requested him. I, I don't know. Well, let me inquire um, among the spectators uh, if Mr. Frank Askin is in the hearing room. Mr. Chairman, uh, I guess he's not here. And uh, I have filed uh, a motion with the clerk of the committee to authorize a subpoena for Mr. Frank Askin and would ask at this time that the clerk read my motion and that we then proceed uh, to consider it. Motion to authorize the subpoena. Mr. Solomon moves that pursuant to Rule 11, Clause 2M of the Rules of the House of Representatives, the Committee on Rules hereby authorizes and directs the Chairman of the Committee to issue a subpoena to Mr. Frank Askin currently a contract consultant to the Committee on Government Operations, requiring his attendance before and testimony to the Committee regarding his work on and knowledge of any substantial evidence about allegations relating to the release of Americans held hostage in Iran in 1980 during his employment by 
or as a consultant to the House of Representatives, provided that any further action by the Committee on Rules on House Resolution 258 and a similar resolution shall be contingent upon the full enforcement of uh, in compliance with the subpoena authorized hearing. Mr. Chairman, I would uh, ask to be heard on my motion. Gentlemen's recognized. Mr. Chairman, I, I really regret having to do this and, and having to take up the committee's time. Uh, you've been good to meet with me uh, earlier today and uh, trying to work out this uh, uh, this problem uh, of not being able to get the witnesses that we wanted to come before us. But let me just explain why we think the testimony of Mr. Frank Aspen is so terribly important. And uh, I hope you would, would listen because I am very sincere about this. As we indicated in our letter to Chairman Moakley on October 30th in which we invoked our right to call additional witnesses, we pointed out that Mr. Frank Askins perhaps more than any other person in this Congress, except now another name has popped up, uh, which I'll discuss maybe with the, uh, with the good witnesses that are going to appear from uh, GAO, uh, more than anybody else has been involved in the extensive work on allegations about a so-called October surprise. His work dates back to his service with the Judiciary Committee, he being Frank Askin that we're trying to subpoena today, uh, dates back to 1988. It continued with his first contract with the Government Operations Committee in 1990, and so far as I know, continues to this day under the second contract, uh, which I, is, uh, I believe is still in effect. Uh, in Barbara Honecker's book, which uh, is called October Surprise, which I think most people in this room who are interested uh, know about, Mr. Askin announced, and this is a quote in his book, uh, in her book, that his investigation would nevertheless go forward based upon a review of documentation for the charges to date, Mr. Mr. Askin was able to say that while the evidence is not yet conclusive, it is substantial. Now, that's his quote in the book. I would point out that the statements uh, was made over a year and a half before Mr. Askin helped initiate a GAO investigation, uh, which we can talk to the witnesses about today in those allegations, and over two years before the GAO completed that investigation without finding a shred of evidence to substantiate any of the allegations Chairman Conyers or Mr. Askin requested them to pursue. I think it is absolutely essential that for this committee to know whether Mr. Askin does indeed have documentation that the GAO was unable to obtain over a six-month period, that he considers substantial evidence that there was something to those allegations. Now, you'll listen carefully to the GAO testimony, their written testimony, and what they will have to say, which backs up what I've just said. Without that testimony, without Mr. Askin's testimony, we have nothing but rumors on which to base our decision as to whether to launch a new multi-million dollar investigation. That is an unacceptable basis for me as a member of this House or for this minority side to support an investigation. And I think it would be unacceptable to the American people as well that we would be wasting taxpayers' dollars on such groundless rumors. And at the appropriate time, maybe I'll read you a letter from uh, Kansas, not one of my constituents, another one from Jacksonville, Florida, uh, people who just highly object to this terrible waste. My colleagues are aware both the New Republic and Newsweek this week contained lengthy investigative stories on the so-called October surprise and both came to the same conclusion. These two magazines, which I would be glad to give to any of you if you don't have them, in which they say in their conclusion, quote, the whole thing is a myth and a fabrication with nothing whatsoever to back it up. Turning to our specific request, let me say that Chairman Conyers has no grounds on which to prevent Mr. Askin's testimony before us. He cannot invoke, he cannot invoke the speech and debate clause or congressional immunity or congressional privilege to block Mr. Askin's appearance. That provision of the Constitution only applies to persons outside of the Congress who try to question members or staff regarding their legislative activities. The Rules Committee is not another place this is part of the same House that the Government Operations Committee is a part of. And I would refer, refer my colleagues to Hines' Precedents, Volume 3, Section 1777, and a precedent cited in the House Manual <coughs> at Section 346. In both instances, one in 1837 and the other in 1923, members of the House were summoned before House committees. Members of the House, not employees, 
were summoned before House committees to testify on charges that they had made about certain executive branch officials. Now, in both instances, Mr. Chairman, I know you want to be fair, the members attempted to invoke their constitutional privilege or congressional immunity against testifying. In the first instance, the committee found that such a position was not, and I quote, just or reasonable. And in 1923, uh, another case which involved a subpoena of the member by the Judiciary Committee, the committee said in its report, and I quote, your committee is of the opinion that Mr. Keller was legally required to obey said committee and that the excuse submitted through his said attorney is without merit. Now, if a member cannot refuse a summons before a committee of his own house, it is preposterous to think that a staffer can be above that process. In fact, I've been informed that several years ago, the Government Operations Committee, the same committee that won't come before us today, had a staff member of the Post Office Committee brought before them, and that staff committee did come in and testify. So if you're looking for precedents, the Government Operations Committee is probably a good place to start. It can hardly turn around and say it cannot do what it has required a staffer on another committee to do. And finally, Mr. Chairman, and I'll wrap it up, I would point out that Mr. Askin is not even considered a committee employee under House rules. He is a contract consultant. He is a hired consultant, and according to House Administration Regulation E2D, and I quote, the consultant is to act as an independent contractor and not as an employee of the committee. In this regard, I would point out that those same regulations <coughs> require that consultant contracts be approved by a majority of the committee. And with respect to Mr. Askin's contract in 1990 and 1991, both were co-signed by Chairman Conyers and ranking Republican Horton. I've asked Congressman Horton in his capacity as the co-signer of that contract whether he would have any objection to Mr. Askin's appearance before our committee. He responded on November 5th, and I quote, I have no problem with Mr. Frank Askin testifying before your committee to discuss his knowledge and his work on the alleged October surprise and the work on the Government Operations Committee in this area. And his letter goes on, and I think this is significant to note, Mr. Chairman. Neither I nor any member of my staff were informed by Chairman Conyers, Mr. Askin, or anyone as to the existence and nature of this investigation at any time during its course. Mr. Chairman, I really think we must recognize that all of our committees and all of our staff <coughs> are agents of the House, and they are not autonomous entities answerable to no one. If our committee has a legitimate concern and jurisdiction over a matter as we do with this one, and we need information or testimony in the possession of another committee, another member, or their staff, it is appropriate for us to ask, since we all work for the same institution, and our purpose is to make that institution work. To refuse such cooperation is contemptuous of this House and the Judiciary Committee report of 1923, which I cited, makes that quite clear. And Mr. Chairman, I'd be glad to yield to my colleague. I, uh, I thank my friend for yielding. And Mr. Chairman, I'd like to uh, associate myself with the very cogent remarks made by uh, our distinguished ranking member here. And in your opening statement, Mr. Chairman, you said these are serious and disturbing allegations. These, I wrote that down when you had said that. And it seems to me that if these are, in fact, serious and disturbing allegations, that we have an obligation to do everything that we can to get to the bottom of this. Having listened to reports, having read the articles in the New Republic and Newsweek, having looked at the kinds of hearings that have often been held by congressional committees in the past, I've concluded that it would be a horrendous waste of taxpayer dollars for us to pursue this. But for us to pursue it without even having the opportunity to hear from a witness who would be very important in the decision-making process, I think would be a great disservice to this committee. And I hope very much that this committee will support the resolution of the gentleman from New York. Uh, in response to the gentleman's motion, uh, the gentleman from New York and I met with Mr. Conyers and we talked about Mr. Askin. Mr. Conyers said that Mr. Askin didn't know anything about it. His name in that book, he refuted it. He said that he had given nobody any authority to have his name placed in that book. He knew nothing about it. 
Uh, and I think even at this time, uh, we have five witnesses to appear before the committee before Mr. Askin, and I think maybe your motion at this time may be premature because we, unless you know that Mr. Askin definitely is not coming before the committee, is something I don't know. Well, Mr. Chairman, I, I did, uh, out of courtesy, because I appreciated the, uh, the way that Mr. Conyers uh, conducted himself in our earlier meeting, and he was a gentleman, and I, I appreciate that among all members. Uh, I just had a, a conversation with him on the floor because I had not heard back after I had called and said that we, we had to go ahead and have him come before us and cited our reasons, and he informed me that he would not be here. He and that's why, okay. uh, why I have to make the motion that I make right, right. now. Well, in response to the minority's request, that this committee issue a subpoena to compel the presence of Mr. Frank Askin before the committee, I would like to express the following concerns. First, I'd like to make it clear that invitations were extended to those persons designated by the minority. Moreover, the minority drafted its own letter to Mr. Askin. The testimony we will hear from the General Accounting Office today will indicate that the investigation was done in strict compliance with the GAO's operating procedures. Moreover, there is no suggestion that the Committee on Government Operations use the General Accounting Office in a way contrary to the GAO's relationship with any other committees. The information that the minority members seek to obtain from Mr. Askin would, be more, would more properly be obtained from Chairman Corneas himself. In a meeting with Mr. Solomon and myself this morning, Mr. Corneas candidly described his committee's investigation, his reason for requesting the investigation, the particular area of inquiry and the end results. Moreover, Mr. Carney has expressed willingness to allow Mr. Askin to brief the minority prior to the hearing, and this offer was rejected. So as I try to outline in my opening statement, the pro proper focus of this hearing is to determine whether the task force is necessary. I believe we will have heard enough testimony of sufficient depth from the people who conducted the investigation to allow the members to make the judgment. The calling of congressional employees before the Committee on Rules has caused me great concern. We cannot find in the precedence of the House an example of when one committee has subpoenaed another, a congressional employee from another committee to question him on that committee's work. I think if this sub subpoena is approved, it would become a very dangerous precedent that would undermine any sense of comedy that must exist between committees. Committees are established by the House and are accountable to the House, not to other committees. The only committee charged with overseeing the conduct of members and employees of the House is the Committee on Standards of Official Conduct. As I stated earlier, there has been no assertion of any wrongdoing on the committee or its employees. I therefore urge members of this committee to reject the motion to issue a subpoena. But before we vote, I would again suggest that we postpone this motion until Mr. Askew's name appears on the roster, and he's asked to actually testify before the committee. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Solomon. At your, uh, your request, since uh, it's within your prerogative to, uh, to call the witnesses, uh, even though it's, uh, th this hearing was called at the request of the minority, and I would have preferred to have called the witnesses in that order, um, I will delay my motion uh, until we've heard the other witnesses, the GAO people. If I might just uh, might say, Mr. Chairman, you know, your letter uh, at my request that went out to Mr. Conyers uh, requested that he or his designee appear, uh, and he chose not to himself as well uh, as, as Mr., uh, Mr. Askin. And what we need is to have it on the record. And I don't care if the television is turned on or off, you can turn it off. Uh, but Mr. Askin could have come and gone on the record and said the same thing that you just said, that he had no evidence, which showed that the Vice President, or rather the President Bush, had anything to do with it, was out of the country at all. That's what this testimony is going to show here today by the GAO people, who I think did a, did a, did a very good job uh, in spite of the direction that they received and, and, and the fact that they were limited in, in where they could go. Uh, they did a good job. But that's why we wanted them here, to go on record to say that all of these accusations that he claimed to have in his possession actually weren't there. And now he admits it, but yet he won't come before this committee. He won't even give us anything in writing to submit for the record. And that's why I just 
really feel uh, upset that, uh, that we aren't going to be able to bring him, which I assume you will be voting down the, uh, uh, the motion. But uh, I will, at your request, uh, delay this motion until we've heard the, uh, the witnesses, and then at the appropriate time, I would ask to be recognized to make my motion, if that's all right. The gentleman yield. I'd be glad to yield to the you chairman. You made Harris. some very valid points. And it's my understanding that the GAO investigation was made by Democrats only. Republicans were not informed, no part of it. And here we have a motion made by Mr. Solomon, and in effect it's turned down, which would indicate to me it's entirely a partisan matter. And I, I feel disturbed that the minority doesn't have the right to bring in someone to testify. And if he should not come in voluntarily, I will join you, Mr. Solomon, and the others on this side to see that he is brought in because any investigation spending millions of dollars, and don't kid yourself, it will be millions of dollars, should not have a partisan tinge to it whatsoever. It should be a factual. And if Ronald Reagan is brought into it, I think President Carter should be brought into it. And I think it's a matter of, of opinion on both sides, and I think each side is very sincere, and I don't question anyone's uh, stand in this regard, but I do think we ought to go forward to hear the witnesses as has been requested by the minority. Thank you for you. Thank you. Uh, in answer to the gentleman from Tennessee, it's not unusual for a minority or majority people to have the GAO work on a matter without consulting the other side. This isn't something brand new. This, this happens very, very often. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Dreyer. I'd just like to say that in light of the, uh, the statement of the gentleman from New York that he's going to withhold his uh, motion, I'd like to withhold my support of his motion until he makes it. Uh, Mr. Derrick. Uh, any, Mr. Billings have any statement? Mr. Frost, anybody have any statement? Mr. Chairman? Yes, Mr. Solomon. In light of the, uh, what's just transpired and withholding my motion, I would like to uh, indulge the committee to make an opening statement on the, uh, the legislation before us that we're going to mark up and the, uh, uh, and the witnesses that are appearing before us. Might I be recognized? You may be recognized. Oh. Would you like to? I'd be glad to yield to you. Okay. Mr. Chairman, given what has just transpired, let me, let me just say this. The Rules Committee has been asked by the Democratic leadership to create an October Surprise Task Force with unlimited funds, unlimited travel authority, unlimited staff, and unlimited time to investigate a pack of wild rumors about things that might have happened over 10 years ago. If I were a little more cynical and uncaring about the taxpayers' dollars, I was sent here to protect. I might just sign on as a member of this task force, since it will apparently be checking out a lot of hotels in Paris and Madrid. Maybe it'd be nice to travel over there, I don't know. But that's not why I was sent to this Congress. As my colleagues know, I'm a great fan of Ronald Reagan, and I resent anyone trying to claim that he somehow stole an election by cutting a deal on the release of hostages. But like him, I would rather the rumors be checked out and dispelled than remain hanging over his head for the rest of his life, because I admire him too much. Much against my own heart, I was willing to allow this task force to be created to attempt to get to the bottom of all of these if it was going to be a fair, an honest, objective, and a bipartisan investigation. Maybe like President Reagan, I'm a little too trusting of others in believing that the Democrats were willing to pursue this matter in a nonpartisan manner. But our leadership negotiated with the Democrat leadership on this, and the Speaker would not yield for whatever reasons. The Democrats wanted to do it their way, suspending House rules and fair procedures to conduct, if not a partisan witch hunt, then a wild goose chase designed to fill the skies with clouds of feathers and honking doubts come next November. Moreover, the Democrat leadership refused to allow the inquiry to cover the Carter administration and his campaign even though the GAO recently told us that it would be essentially essential for any thorough investigation that it look at 
contemporaneous efforts by the government to secure the release of the hostages. Cover it both ways. For our part on the Republican side, we have tried to get to the bottom of what is going on and what is going on. We have learned indirectly by about an extensive and secret four-year investigation conducted into these October surprise allegations by two committees and one investigative agency of Congress. We have attempted to learn what evidence, if any, those efforts have turned up to justify yet a third committee to investigate at additional millions of dollars in cost to the American taxpayers. And what have we gotten? We have gotten the refusal of the committee chairman who reportedly directed these two investigations to appear before us to share his information with us, members of Congress. And we have gotten the refusal of the main staffer involved in these two other investigations to even appear before us, with or without a subpoena, to share his findings and his recommendations and to tell us what he thinks. And yet we are being asked to create yet another investigative committee to go over much of the same ground as these two other secret partisan inquiries. And keep in mind that they were both conducted without the knowledge, approval, or participation of any Republican, any minority party. How does this Rules Committee attempt to get to the bottom of all this? On a straight party line vote, you Democrats are going to reject my subpoena of Mr. Askin. I can feel it coming. Mr. Chairman, please put yourself in our shoes and you other members. What would you think if every time you turned for information you were refused, and yet you were asked to authorize unlimited tax dollars to engage in more information gathering? One might conclude that those who are refusing to appear before us either have something to hide or have nothing to offer. In either event, that is hardly a strong basis on which to proceed with a further investigation. I personally talked to Chairman Conyers this morning, and I believe him when he says, and I quote him, they have nothing to hide, and furthermore, that they have found nothing as a result of their four-year investigation. John Conyers is a real gentleman, and I don't think he would mislead us in that way. On the other hand, we do not know how much information his contract consultant has gathered. We have been informed today by Chairman Conyers that Mr. Askin claims he never stated in 1988 that he had substantial evidence regarding these allegations, yet he told the GAO he did, and he got them to go out and do all this investigation based on that information. I think it's important to get that on record right here today under oath so that we know conclusively that there is no substantial evidence behind these allegations. That was the reason for our subpoena request, and that is why I refused to settle for just a private meeting with Mr. Askin. Chairman Conyers has now informed us that he has found nothing. The GAO is about to testify it has found nothing. And now two magazines this week have cover stories, and those are pretty reputable magazines, one liberal and one moderate that they have come to no conclusion that which, there is indeed is the anything liberal. at all there. Here's the New Republic's November 18th issue. I just showed you. What October Surprise it's entitled, an article by Stephen Emerson and Jesse Furman. Let me just quote from one paragraph on page 16. You gentlemen have all read it, but you other people haven't. But the truth is, they say, the conspiracy as currently postulated is a total fabrication. None of the evidence cited to support the October surprise stands up to the scrutiny, and I'm still quoting, the key sources on whose word the story rests are documented frauds and imposters. And here's the November 11th issue of Newsweek magazine. Newsweek magazine that reads, quote, the October surprise, the charge, treason, the evidence, myth. That's their headline. Let me quote from a paragraph on pages 18 and 19 of that article. This is a quote. Newsweek has found, after a long investigation, including interviews with government officials and other knowledgeable sources around the world, that the key claims of the purported eyewitnesses and accusers simply do not hold up. Continuing the quote, what the evidence does show is the murky history of a conspiracy theory run wild. Mr. Chairman, I think these investigative reports can best be summed up by saying that the advocates of the October surprise theory are spinning their conspiratorial webs out of cotton candy or something else, I don't know what. 
and I, for one, will have nothing to do with authorizing yet another taxpayer-funded, magical, mythical tour into this kind of conspiracy. I appreciate the uh, committee giving me the time to uh, vent my feelings, but I really am annoyed that we can't get to the bottom of this by having employees or consultant contractors come to us and level with us so that we can put it on the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Derrick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I had not intended to make an opening statement, but uh, I thought I might, uh, might make one just the same since Mr. Solomon found it necessary uh, uh, to do so. I am not an advocate of anything other than the integrity of this country. And I hear that this is going to cost too much and that is going to cost too much. We're all conscious of dollars. But I want someone to put a price on the integrity of the United States of America for me. I don't think it can be bought and sold, and I don't think it can be measured in dollars and cents. Very responsible people have come forward with information that would indicate that this matter needs to be investigated. I do not know whether it is true. No one knows whether it is true. U.S. News and World Report and, and uh, uh, the New Republic and other magazines can spin what stories they may. But that is all that has happened in this entire investigation is the spinning of stories on both sides of the issue. To say that there has been a four-year investigation uh, is questionable. There has been no investigation of this. As these uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen will testify here in a few uh, minutes, this was no investigation of October Surprise. No one in this October Surprise event who represented in any committee did any investigation has ever been put under subpoena, I mean has, has been subpoenaed. No one has ever been put under oath. So what we have is two conflicting uh, stories here. And as far as I'm concerned, it behooves the integrity of this country, the integrity of the Congress, to investigate uh, to come to the truth of the matter. As the chairman said in the very beginning, uh, this is a very serious matter. If these charges are true, it comes close to treason. If they're not true, then those who have been suggested uh, to be, have been incorporated in this, need to be cleared as well. If these charges are true, it goes to the most prized possessions of the democratic process, and that is the circumvention of our electoral process. Now, I don't know whether these charges are true or not, but I think it behooves us to find out if they're true. Because if they are true, this nation has been done a tremendous injustice. The democratic process has been done a tremendous injustice. So let's get ahead with the uh, investigation. Let's find out if they are true and set them out of the rest. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Quillen, do you have an opening statement? Following through uh, my remarks a moment ago, you know, 10 years ago, this was supposed to have occurred. I wonder if it's a coincidence that the investigation is being asked for just before a presidential election. I think the American people are going to look at this matter as entirely a partisan thing, and I would hope this Rules Committee, Mr. Chairman, would delete that perception so that we can get down to the facts in the case, irrespective of politics. I think if the investigation was made by GAO and there was a taint or just a, a a rumor that something had gone wrong uh, dealing with the hostages. The investigation should have been years ago, certainly months ago. I don't believe that this committee should put 
uh, the American people into the situation that we are a part of a partisan investigation. Somehow, the uh, record should be made to demonstrate that, and I hope before this committee acts one way or the other that we can do that, and I would plead with you, Mr. Chairman, that something be done to take it out of the partisan stage and really get down to an investigation that all of the people of America would applaud rather than having a perception that it is absolutely partisan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Billinson, do you have a statement? Well, I didn't. I don't have a statement, Mr. Chairman, but let me just say very briefly in response to a couple of things that our colleagues on the other side have said. I, I would hope that our Republican colleagues believe in their hearts that this is not meant to be anything terribly partisan. It, in fact, it's not, certainly from those of us who are over here. And as a matter of fact, last week when we first examined this whole process or the potential procedure, I thought we had a very nice nonpartisan kind of discussion, especially between Mr. Hamilton and Mr. Hyde, who are apparently intended to be the, the chairman and the ranking members of, of the task force if, in fact, we, we authorize them to, to go ahead. So I hope after we get through the difficulties of today or perhaps next week and whenever we finally make our final decision here in the Rules Committee on this matter that we'll settle down to business or the task force will, I'm sure it will, and they'll carry on quite well together in a collegial manner. There's no real question that Mr. Hyde and Mr. Hamilton and, the, and their colleagues who are about to be appointed to that task force will, will, will get along well. They're extraordinarily able group of people and, and I've got no, you know, I don't have any worries about it thereafter. But I don't want people to think that we're going into it in, 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 in that manner. Our colleague from New York, our friend uh, Mr. Solomon said at the very outset today, 25 or 30 minutes ago, in referring to those last week's, I guess, or earlier this week's um, articles in both Newsweek and, and New Republic, that they both came to the conclusions that the whole thing is a myth and, and a fabrication. I think those were your very words, Jerry. Uh, I must say that I personally believe that that conclusion is correct. I certainly hope so. I also believe that whatever the limited amount of investigations that may have been undertaken by the two committees that the gentleman referred to earlier, which one of which I guess really will be reported to us today by GAO, I suppose those were the, that was the investigating arm of at least one of those committees, that I also think it's fair to say, since we've already spoken to some of these witnesses privately, that they've not come up with any real evidence uh, either. But we've always known, I think it's fair to say, we've always known that that was the, the situation, that that was the likely uh, truth of the matter, that this is a very unlikely, uh, this allegation uh, is very unlikely to have been, or these allegations very unlikely have been to, to be proven out to be true. But we also know and continue to know that there are a lot of people out there, fortunately or unfortunately, in, the, in this country of ours who continue to believe in these things. And we do believe, all of us on this side, and I, I'm sure you said it yourself, Mr. Solomon, and Dave, prior to, I think, that it would be in the best interest of, of the nation and its politics if we could finally lay some of these questions to rest. And we are all hopeful, frankly, that if and when this, this task force gets, uh, uh, gets going, that uh, it's in the final analysis, that's exactly what will happen. That will be a very good thing for all of us. So please don't misunderstand our motives. They're certainly not partisan. And I certainly hope, as I suggested just a moment or two ago, uh, that it turns out that neither our former president or any of the folks who were associated with him had anything to do with any of these allegations. Well, the gentleman, you want to of course. I don't want to interrupt him because of course, I don't no. want to interrupt him. The gentleman's finished. Well, you, you know, and, and I, I do agree with you, and, and nobody wants to get into this kind of a, a situation because it's, you know, it's, it's tough enough here trying to do what's right, uh, and it's much easier to be able to work with each other rather than against each other. And, but, you know, we, we were just really shut out of uh, any kind of consideration on putting together this, uh, this task force. Uh, we had recommended that uh, we include the Carter situation because the time goes back. And, Tony, we were shut out of that. We weren't even given a consideration. We wanted to limit it to six months and then, re, uh, then continue it if necessary so that we didn't get into this uh, $20 million expenditure, you know, of the taxpayer. We wanted to make it a joint uh, uh, investigation with the Senate. Uh, we wanted to do as we usually do on, on task forces like this, to have an equal five and five or eight and eight members. And yet we are, we're being shut out of that. And that's what, uh, you know, that's why we, we are so cynical. And, and I don't want to be. I, I want to try to cooperate in any way we can. I said I wanted to get to the bottom of it because I love Ronald Reagan. I, I want to see his name cleared. But, you know, we can't. Uh, go about it this way and, and have it all one-sided. That's what we're concerned about. But I know you're sincere and I respect you for and it. You know, and you know Mr. Hamilton is, Hamilton is sincere and you know that uh, 
however this task force is eventually set up, if it is, they will pursue it in a fair manner. And you know you've got your chaps there watching them and riding herd on them. And uh, the last thing Mr. Hamilton and his Democratic colleagues on that task force, if it is to be established, want to do or find themselves in such a position as to be able to be uh, accused of, of the Republicans, the minority members on that task force, of not having pursued this in a totally nonpartisan manner. So I am sure for no other reason than to, than to protect their, their eventual conclusions, whatever they may turn out to be, they're going to, as I'm sure the gentleman knows deep in his heart, will carry this on, even if all of, in, in a proper manner, even if all of the procedures that our friends from the minority uh, suggest they want are not, are not in fact given. Let me also say very briefly that not all of those procedures, as this member understands it, have yet been conclusively decided upon. And this gentleman, among many others, has been suggesting that some changes in those proposed procedures perhaps can be talked about because there's nothing more that many of us would like than to have our friends from the minority side as on board as possible from the beginning if, in fact, this does take place. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Chairman. I think, uh, in, in uh, going along with uh, what Mr. Billings has said, I think in the opening salvos we tried to mediate the, the investigation and, and asked uh, Lee Hamilton if he would exceed to certain desires because agree, I, I just don't want any, anything with a tinge of a partisan witch hunt or whatever because it's much too important not only for for the members but for the institution and also for the presidency. And, and uh, so I think that maybe after we have our opening statements and we hear from GAO, maybe we'll get some information that we just don't have ready available to us right now. Mr. Dreyer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. You know, some very uh, interesting statements have been made, and uh, <clears throat> we're all very concerned about the integrity of the United States, which is what Mr. Derrick raised as a question. And I think that the integrity of the United States and the United States Congress is seriously jeopardized if we pursue nothing but uh, a witch hunt that is, in fact, tremendously costly to the American taxpayers. We should spend whatever is necessary to get to the bottom of something that really has a basis in fact or when real evidence has come forward. But it seems to me that while last week there was a, a great deal of comedy amongst those who were testifying, testifying here and uh, members of this committee, that was before we had the fiasco whereby uh, the chairman of a committee uh, which has been involved in this refused to allow <coughs> Uh, a consultant from that committee to come forward here, which is apparently what has happened based on what Mr. Solomon has just told us. And uh, also it was before the new Republican Newsweek articles came out. Now, I don't think that every congressional investigation should be basing itself or its actions on uh, the uh, reportings in uh, different magazines. But uh, I do believe that we have a responsibility here to, yes, find out the truth, but as evidence continues to build that this was, in fact, uh, not uh, the case, uh, I think that we have an obligation to uh, be concerned about the integrity of this institution, too. Now, I'd like to believe that uh, my good friend from Los Angeles, Mr. Bielenson, is absolutely right when he says that there is not uh, a tinge of partisanship here. And I, Tony and I are very good friends, and I don't believe that on his part there is a tinge of partisanship on this issue. But I can't help but think, I was just handed the, the last paragraph of the New Republic article, which I'd like to share with the committee, which gets back to the situation in 1980. It said, referring to Gary Six, six stubborn perpetuation of the story is all the more surprising, given the scorn with which he greeted the Republicans' allegations in 1980 that Carter was planning an October surprise to win the election. Six years ago, writing to the Council of Foreign Relations, he declared, in the last few months before the presidential elections, there were spurious reports that the Carter administration was planning a spectacular military operation against Iran. The so-called October surprise allegedly, allegedly would be intended to win votes for the president. The story was a total fabrication. It was promptly denied by the White House, and a number of responsible newspapers refused to print it. Nevertheless, the story received widespread attention and soon developed a life of its own. And my concern, Tony, is that that's exactly what's happening here. Even though time and time again we have had evidence which has come forward to us that it is not the case. And that's why I think that as we continue to talk to the American people, I have over the last few weeks talked to many people, and we have 
the letters here to which Mr. Solomon referred earlier uh, that have come from across the country. Uh, this really is, uh, I believe, a horrendous waste for us to pursue it at this point, and I hope very much that until we have further evidence that comes forward and until it can be handled in a more amicable way with respect to uh, the minority, I hope that we'll reject this. The gentleman realizes at this time there's no dollar value or, or, or time limit on this thing. This, it's this unlimited thing. from the way I, I heard Mr. Solomon's opening statement, and he said that there, is, there is no determination, so I can only infer There hasn't infer been any that. determination at the time. Right, but so I can only infer from that that it would be virtually unlimited. Well, I, I think it's a little premature for that also. Yeah. Mr. Frost. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll be brief. Um, I personally am uh, somewhat skeptical <coughs> Uh, about this entire yeah. operation that uh, anything will ultimately be found. Having said that, I draw from my own experience um, before ele being elected to Congress a number of years ago, uh, I was a newspaper and a magazine reporter. Um, I would love to have had subpoena power or been able to put people under oath when I was working as a reporter. I never had that authority. I never had anything even approaching that. And I think uh, the country is best served by having a, uh, an investigation in this matter. Uh, I will be very surprised if the investigation turns up anything. Uh, but I think that we should lay this to rest. We should structure this investigation so that it will be done speedily and fairly and get the matter behind us. And I read very carefully the report in Newsweek um, this week. It's an interesting story. There are interesting stories on the other side. And I will tell you, um, I don't know what to believe, and I would hope that we have a, a fair panel, I think we will, that resolves this matter quickly so the country knows the answer. Thank, Thank you, Mr. you. Chairman. Mr. McEwen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I join in the statements that have been made already on this side, especially the fact that tens of thousands of dollars and hundreds of man hours have already been invested in this fishing, fishing expedition of which every single person has come up uh, with a dry hole, except for the fact that, that these people have been proven uh, to be imposters. They represent themselves as in, uh, the people that are, are claiming these things represent themselves as intelligence operatives. They've concocted allegations that are demonstrably false, and their stories full of internal inconsistencies are contradictory, uh, to quote the, the recent articles this week. Every single story has been rearranged and, and changed over time. Uh, one of them saw President Bush, absolutely he was there, I know it. And then uh, someone whispered in his ear, you know the Secret Service keeps track of where they are and they can tell exactly where he was. Well, lo and behold, I don't think he was there that day. But we did when we refueled there in Reykjavik, why, yes sir, that was, uh, I can tell you the weather conditions. And pilot says, I've never been to Reykjavik in my entire life, let alone fly the Vice President of the United States over there. And, and it just gets on and on and on and on. And many of us uh, would not be so suspicious if we could, if some of my amendments could be considered, uh, I will pose when the time comes. One of them is that it not be a partisan staff, it not be a partisan breakdown. If this is an investigation for the survival of the Republic and the preservation of the Constitution, it need not be lopsided, Democrat to Republican. Uh, it could be equally constituted. Uh, secondly, it, it, there has to be some, uh, this entitlement program for for uh, these fishing expeditions is now one currently underway for over $40 million for Mr. Walsh. Dear man is spending money faster than the Treasury can print it and has yet come up with a single, a single felony conviction. Pleaded with some people here the other week when their Congress was thinking about shutting him down, went up and said, if you'll just plead guilty to a misdemeanor, I can have something on my books here. And, and besides, I'll get off your back and won't threaten to take your retirement and all that sort of thing. And so he, he, he's gotten a couple of couple of misdemeanors, but short of that, it's still flopping around here for all, all these five years later. My amendment will say that you can't start one until you end the other. And when, uh, when we end Mr. Walsh, then we can go after, after these folks back in the 1980 campaign. Perhaps when we finish that, we can get back to the 1960 campaign. We can exhume Mr. Daly and see how he did in that election. Uh, Mr. Chairman, er, this is just really, as, as Newsweek said, it's, it's, it's gone wild. And it's, uh, it's to the point that we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't play with it any further with the taxpayers' dollars. Uh, I'm going to suggest that one of the political campaigns pay for it if they're so concerned about it. And if this is a nonpartisan effort, then uh, let's have the reports be confidential and that the reports be made to the members of Congress and that there not be uh, public presentations. This one that we're dealing with right now will expire along about the month before the election next year. And, uh, 
uh, let me just tell you what's going to happen if, if, if this thing passes. I am willing to stake everything that I own on the fact that it's going to be inconclusive, that we really just can't be sure. Maybe it was Bill Casey and, and Ronald Reagan and George Bush over there cutting deals, and, and uh, maybe these Iranians really weren't real bright. And when, when Mr. Sick offered him on behalf of President Carter $150 million, a uh, bird in the hand, sure thing with a sitting president, that this Casey fella coming in there offered him maybe $150 million next January if we win. Uh, maybe they just said, that sounds like a better deal to us. Let's just slam dunk the current president and let's, let's go after that one. But we can't be absolutely certain. And maybe after a couple of more years, a few hundred million dollars, why uh, we might be able just uh, over the horizon be able to conclude this a little bit. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this is unbecoming the Congress of the United States. This is really uh, just unbecoming the electoral process. Uh, this is all 12 people in the seventh grade weren't born when these allegations took place. And uh, you would think that, that that would be sufficient for some folks uh, to, to let this lay to rest, but evidently it's not. And so my final uh, amendment will be that if we're interested in getting to the facts, we had great pontifications on television and elsewhere over the last, uh, over to the Iran-Contra hearing, which is our 1988 exercise. That was for the 88 campaign, now we're in the 92 campaign, so we're now nothing fresh, and so we're going back to 1980 to use as our, as our platform for the 92 electoral process funded by the taxpayers to attack the sitting president. But uh, one of my proposals will be that, uh, that uh, those people that are, are involved, that uh, those who stand to benefit would, be, uh, would pay the bill, and that also that it would be restricted to one at a time, and then uh, finally that, uh, that the reports uh, come, come in a classified manner, and unless that be the goal of, uh, of the public uh, presentation, the public pontification. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I... Uh, I wish you success. You can't make, a, can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. And it's going to be very hard to make this fishing expedition look respectable uh, when it's obviously established for such purposes as, uh, as we see that it is established. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Wheat. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, none of us relishes or uh, is enjoying the process by which we are uh, establishing this committee to investigate these very serious allegations. And it appears from some of the comments today uh, that we are going to enjoy it less as time goes by. Uh, but nonetheless, it is our responsibility to make sure that the serious questions that have been raised do get answered. We hope the answers will be that no one inside or outside of the U.S. government in any position of responsibility ever jeopardized the lives of, of U.S. citizens. Uh, but I think the American people deserve an answer on that question. I think we can start to get to those answers if we actually listen to the witnesses that we've invited here today, as opposed to making more speeches. So I'll forgo any further statement. I hope the witnesses offer more information to us than we do to them. <laughs> Mr. Gordon. Uh, Mr. Chairman, very briefly, um, our colleague Jerry Solomon in his opening remarks said that these accusations were serious and disturbing. Uh, I certainly agree with that. I think that's the reason that former President uh, Ronald Reagan as well as former President uh, Jimmy Carter uh, have both requested uh, that, these, that these accusations be investigated and be resolved. Um, obviously it has been a long time, 10 years is a long time. The longer we wait, uh, the longer it is, uh, the longer it will be. And so I think we need to move forward. Uh, I share some of the skepticism uh, that I've heard on this committee, but I guess it was Shakespeare that said me, uh, was it said, uh, me thinks you protest too much. Uh, as I listen to the minority uh, uh, rant and rave about uh, this process, I wonder uh, maybe there is something or why do they protest so much? Uh, so certainly let's get on, let's move on with this, let's have it fair, and let's get it done. Ms. Slaughter. Mr. Chairman, I think I'm going to be willing to stand on the statements I made last week, uh, which basically summed up that I think we have a constitutional obligation here, and I support the task force. Uh, and I'm, I'm surprised that we can't have some kind of open mind here and let the people come up with some uh, information and tell us one way or another. I mean, the prejudgment here, I think, is very unbecoming. Thank you. Unbecoming? The, uh, we're going to call uh, the people in the General Accounting Office, and, and if they will come to the table as a panel, and, and at least two of you will have to bring your own chairs. <laughs> Miss Barbara Cott, Assistant Director for National Security, Office of Special Investigations. Ms. Cecilia Porter, Ms. Cecilia Porter, Special Agent, Office of Special Investigations. James A. 
F. Hinchman, General Counsel, and William A. Gherkins, Office of Congressional Relations. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Counsel. Uh, I am uh, James Hinchman, the General Counsel of GAO. Uh, with me today uh, is Mr. Gherkins from our Office of Congressional Relations on my right. Uh, on my far left uh, is Barbara Cart from the uh, Office of Special Investigations, and on my immediate left, uh, Cecilia Porter from that office. We are pleased to be here to have the opportunity. Sure? <laughs> <laughs> we are certainly honored to be here, Mr. Okay. Chairman. And I, I think, in fact, we are pleased to be here as well. Uh, and to uh, describe for you uh, the results and the scope of our uh, inquiry into a limited number of the allegations that surround this uh, general charge that in 1980 there were negotiations with the Iranian government for the purpose of delaying any release of Americans being held in Iran until after the November election. Uh, I have a prepared statement for this hearing. However, I think that uh, we could better serve uh, the committee if uh, Ms. Porter, who was directly responsible for our investigation, uh, were to describe to you from the perspective of her direct involvement uh, the scope and results of her work. If that's acceptable to the committee, I would ask that my statement be inserted in the record and that she be allowed to proceed. Yes, if, if you just tell us your background, Ms. Porter, before you proceed with your statement. Okay. I'm a special agent with the Office of Special Investigations and the General Accounting Office. I've been there since approximately April of 1990. 90, right? 1990. Prior to that, I spent approximately nine and a half years with the Department of Defense, first as a criminal investigator uh, with the Defense Criminal Investigative Service, and prior to that time with Headquarters of the United States Marine Corps uh, in the area of procurement. Part of that time. So my, er my expertise is with DOD and procurement and fraud areas. Is that sufficient? Do you have uh, a formal uh, educational background? Yes, I have a BA from the University of Virginia in Foreign Affairs, uh, as supplemented by numerous courses both in the procurement field. You have to have certification in that field. The U.S. government invested quite a lot of dollars in training me in that area, and subsequent formal training at the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center in Georgia. Uh, numerous white-collar crime courses in addition to the basic criminal investigative schools, so in both areas. Proceed. Mr. Chairman, we have trouble hearing you. Um, yeah, if you could okay. speak, speak up. up a little bit, okay. please. This room isn't very good for Mr. acoustics. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Bailison. Forgive me, and uh, I'm not sure I'm being helpful in this, but I've glanced quickly through Mr. Hinchman's prepared remarks. I think they're important to set the stage of this thing. Now, maybe that other members have read it, uh, and we don't need to go through it, but it it sort of is a useful introduction, it seems to me, to the testimony that this it, gentlewoman will. Party. Yeah, I mean, unless she's going to be saying pretty much the same kinds of things, I think it sets the stage very usefully and very nicely. But it, it, I may be, it may be that you'll be saying these kinds of things too that Mr. Mr. Hinchman had in his. Mr. Hinchman, you're I, familiar with you, what you say. Uh, is Ms. Porter going to say approximately the same things that you have in your statement here? We will, of course, do whatever the uh, committee wishes, sir. But I think you'll find that. Uh, Ms. Porter's remarks will say the same thing, only in somewhat greater detail. Oh. That's fine, then. I just want to make sure that we got this all in All right. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman. Do, yes. we, do, we have, uh, do you have written testimony, Ms. Porter? No, I do not. Okay. I, I thought to facilitate the dissemination of information, I would give an overview of the inquiry, what we specifically did, our findings, and then allow uh, questions to be made and answered. Right. Right. Okay. In July of 1990, the Office of Special Investigations received a request letter. The request letter was from the Subcommittee on Legislation and National Security of the House Government Operations Committee. That request letter specifically requested that we look at allegations made by Richard Brennecke, uh in his trial, which I will discuss in a moment, as to the alleged neg negotiations for a delay in the release of American hostages. Having received that letter, that we met with the subcommittee staff in the July time frame of 1990, and at that time they shared with us information that they had and uh, sources of information referred us to those for invest investigative leads. During the next month and a half, we gathered information, background information, did research and read information. I was not the case agent at that time. Uh, Mr. Jack Taylor was responsible at that time. He was preparing to leave the employee of GAO uh, in the September time frame, and that is when I assumed responsibility for it.
However, I have gone through all of the records for that period and spoken with Mr. Taylor in preparation. In September uh, of that year, we met again with the sub subcommittee staff, and at that point I assumed responsibility, and we had a discussion on the issue, and we decided that with the resources that were available within OSI, which are somewhat limited, uh, and the, the scope of the issue, it was more prudent to determine specific issues and areas that we would focus on. And the decision was made at that point to focus on the allegations mentioned in the request letter, which are the Brennicke allegations, and any natural investigative leads that would stem from those. We Did then... You the Brennicke allegations? Yes. Um, in September of 1988, an individual named Heinrich Rupp was tried for being involved in the, in the laundering or loss of money from a bank in Colorado. At Mr. Rupp's sentencing, Mr. Richard Brennicke, who has described himself as an associate of Mr. Rupp, made representations to the effect that Mr. Rupp, he felt, was being railroaded and prosecuted for his involvement uh, with the CIA and with other activities, and that Mr. Brennicke needed to speak up on Mr. Rupp's behalf. During the course of that process in chambers with the judge, he made some statements to the effect that Mr. Rupp had been involved in a flight to Paris in October of 1980, um, and that he had, was a CIA employee and had knowledge related to that issue. As a result of that, uh, in April and May of 1990, Mr. Brennicke went to trial uh, in Oregon uh, because of his health the trial was moved to Oregon. He was represented by Mr. Michael Scott and Mr. Richard Muller. Uh, the government was represented by Mr. Thomas O'Rourke, the prosecuting the AUSA. So it was at that trial, which he was uh, basically charged with making false declarations before court, uh, that the allegations again surfaced, Mr. Brennicke's statements, that he had personal knowledge of meetings in Paris in October 1980, and specifically that he personally had been involved in those meetings um, and I'll follow up on that in a moment, and, uh, and that he had secondhand knowledge from information that Mr. Rupp had given him regarding the trip to Paris and the flights to Paris. Um, as, with that, does that answer the question? And I'll tell you what Mr. Brennicke told us in our interviews. Yes. With that as the starting uh, point, we determined it would be prudent to get the trial transcript and to get all discovery related to the trial. We gathered that documentation, reviewed it, and then proceeded to interview Mr. Muller, the defense attorney, and Mr. Scott, the defense attorney. We also felt that it, we needed to get a balanced perspective on it, so we needed to talk to the prosecuting attorney, which was Mr. O'Rourke. Essentially, Mr. Muller uh, reconfirmed his belief in his client's statements. Uh, Mr. Scott did the same. We asked them for an opportunity to obtain copies of all of the documentation that they had gathered in preparation for the trial. As a result of that, we had the benefit of Numerous FBI 302s, which are reports of interview and the reports of investigative leads pursued by the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and other documents that they had been gathered. So we reviewed all of that. There was interviews that had been done by the FBI relative to all of these issues, and therefore we were able to conclude from some of the information gleaned there that perhaps some leads didn't need to be pursued and others did. Uh, we then interviewed Mr. Brennicke. Mr. Brennicke stated to me and another agent that he had been uh, contacted by an individual he had described as Mr. Robert Carrot, whom he believed was affiliated with the CIA, and that Mr. Carrot had asked him to participate in a meeting in Paris in October 1980 to provide financial expertise in the laundering of money. Mr. Brennicke described his background as having expertise in this area and having been involved in the establishment of offshore investments and the transfer of funds. Um, Mr. Brennicke stated that he traveled to uh, Paris via commercial airline. He arrived on Saturday, what was subsequently identified as the 18th of October. Then on, then on Sunday, the meetings took place. Um, what he essentially <coughs> said was that at those meetings, Mr. Casey, William Casey, was the focal point of the meetings. Mr. Donald Gregg was present. Uh, there was representatives of the British French and Israeli intelligence communities, as described by Mr. Brennicke, and that he also, during the course of that meeting, was a participant in discussions of the transfer of funds through Mexico, Panama, and Switzerland for the purchase of weapons, uh, to, which would be provided through the Czechoslovakians and the Israelis to the Iranians. Uh, he also stated that Mr. Heinrich Rupp, Rupp had told him that he had piloted a plane with uh, Mr. Casey aboard for said meeting and that they had departed from National Airport. 
Um, based on that, we asked Mr. Brennicke for any documentation to corroborate his statement, specifically um, what passport did he use? He had no recollection of the name on the passport because he stated it was provided by the CIA. Any documentations of the travel, expenses, credit card expenses. Uh, he stated at one point that he conducted business out of his home. I asked him for the toll records from his home. Um, any documentation that would support the events that he alleged transpired on this weekend in October. Mr. Brennicke's attorneys did make, as I stated earlier, a number of documents available to us. Uh, I did not find them to be relevant to this specific weekend in question and in the events that were alleged to have transpired. Um, after that, we traveled then to interview Mr. Rupp, who was also represented by Mr. Michael Scott. Scott. Uh, we wanted to get it firsthand and not rely on secondhand sources. Uh, Mr. Rupp declined several requests for interviews through his attorney, Mr. Scott. As an alternative, Mr. Scott provided a videotaped interview of Mr. Rupp, who was at that time in a, in a federal prison, I believe, uh, that he had made with the local news team. We viewed that videotape and Mr. Rupp stated in that videotape that he had piloted a plane uh, with Casey aboard, he believed, subsequently believed was Casey, and that he had seen on the tarmac in Paris an individual that he was, I believe the terms he used, 98 percent sure was Mr. Bush. Um, in essence, then, we asked the attorneys for any corroborating documentation on Mr. Rupp uh, relative to his passport flight logs, and other information. What we were subsequently provided were some airline identification cards, which his attorneys felt represented Mr. Rupp's connection with CIA proprietary airlines. Um, and we were also provided an envelope from a Paris hotel, which they said was the hotel that he stayed in when he was piloting the aircraft. There was no date or any other indication on that particular envelope. Um, we met with Mr. Thomas O'Rourke then to get the government's perspective on the trial and the evidence produced therein. Mr. O'Rourke, during the course of our interview, declined to make any statements outside of that which appeared on the official record. We returned then, uh, had some additional discussions with the subcommittee staff as to our findings. Uh, some information had come to them. We were asked to pursue that and mutually agreed. We interviewed then. Um, Separately, a Myron Strzok, who had information on arms transferred, had brought this information to the subcommittee staff. The bottom line on Mr. Strzok's information was that he believed he had information that indicated that the government had used companies, specifically Westinghouse, uh, to illegally transfer arms to Iran through the Foreign Military Sales Program. Um, we reported that information back to subcommittee staff. At that time, we were advised that that inquiry was outside the scope of what we were asked to look at and would be separately handled under another request. We did not further pursue that issue. Um, we then tried to focus on following up on the, on the RUP and, and Brennicke issue, any other corroborating information, specifically what were the planes involved, what was the route involved. Uh, we, I once again reiterate, I did not have the opportunity to speak with Mr. RUP directly. I was given the information as to the tail numbers that were allegedly involved and as to the flight route allegedly involved. Using uh, five or six tail numbers, there was supposedly a Bach 111 and a Grumman Gulfstream plane involved uh, to carry the parties to Paris. We attempted to track down and locate those airplanes as the FBI had previously done. We identified one tail number as belonging to Tiger Airways, now then owned by Martin Aviation now. Um, they did not have any records on that. However, we subsequently located Kenneth, Kenneth Qualls, who was the operator for Tiger Airways, and he produced for us the flight log on that particular uh, aircraft. Um, the, that did not show any entries for travel to Paris on the weekend in question. The other aircraft, um, one was a foreign ownership, and thus the FAA does not maintain any information on it. Um, we also contacted the under one scenario depicted there was a refueling at Gander, and under another scenario there was a refueling at Reykjavik, Iceland. We contacted the Civil Air Administration in those countries, asked them if they had any records of planes with tail numbers of these, uh, of the ones involved or were allegedly involved landing at, during those dates. Uh, in one case, they did not maintain records back that far. I believe that was Gander. In Iceland, they had no record of planes departing or refueling or being, being serviced on the dates in question with those tail numbers. We also had information on what we were told was Mr. Rupp's description of the weather on the date in question. We checked the meteorological reports at both locations to see if they would coincide with what we were heard was the description of the weather, and they did not. 
Uh, that essentially is, is, is as far as the Rupp and Brennicke uh, pursuit uh, of information went. We then, uh, in the December time frame, had dis additional discussions with uh, the staff, and it was decided at that point to pursue issues of Mr. Bush's whereabouts, uh, then candidate Bush's whereabouts on the weekend in question. We were asked to um, meet with the Secret Service, interview their agents, and review their records. We did so. Um, we interviewed Mr. William Hudson, who was a witness at the Brennicke trial. Mr. William Hudson and Mr. Leonard Tannis were the two Secret Service agents in charge of the protective detail for then candidate Bush on the weekend in question in October 1980. We interviewed Mr. Hudson. Mr. Hudson had no specific recollection of the weekend in question. We interviewed, uh, at that point, however, we had other information which were the Secret Service uh, protective activity summary logs. They had indicated that there was a stop or a motor cage at the Chevy Chase Country Club on Sunday, uh, the 19th of October. So we went to the Chevy Chase Country Club to see if they maintained any records of a visit by then candidate Bush. Uh, we spoke with the tennis pro, the golf pro, the general manager, and others in an attempt to ascertain what records would be available. The bottom line on that is that the club does not maintain records for that period. They do not have a get photographs, guest log, or any other type of documentation that would have been available to document said visit. Um, at that time, we did not know the purpose of Mr. Bush's visit to the, to the country club. We then followed up about a week or two later. We did the interview of Mr. Leonard Tannis. Mr. Tannis, who is the agent charged with protection of Mr. Uh, Bush on the date in question, had a specific recollection, which he related to us in the interview, uh, of traveling to the Chevy Chase Country Club with Mr. Bush. We asked him why he remembered a specific luncheon 10 or 11 years ago. Uh, he said that he recalled it specifically because he was impressed by the fact that Mr. Bush told him that they would have, be having lunch with a Supreme Court Justice uh, Stuart Potter. Um, it was his first visit there. And I believe it was also his first visit, and he was also a golf enthusiast, he indicated, and he was impressed by that. Um, Based on that information, we then attempted to retrieve the records of Mr. Uh, Potter Stewart, talked to his former secretary, located those records at Yale University to see if there was any appointment entries, once again looking for some documentation of this event. Um, we retrieved those records, and on the weekend in question, there was no entry of any kind. There was an entry for Friday night, uh, but his secretary had advised us that there was no guarantee that he would have enter entered such information into his appointment calendars that could or could not have been there. Um, the other things that we pursued uh, was an interview of, of Kenneth Qualls, did I mention? No. Kenneth Qualls was another pilot who, under one version of the event, was involved in the flight. Mr. Qualls was the operator, managing operator of Tiger Airways. He's the one who provided us the flight logs. Mr. Qualls had no knowledge of the event in question. Um, we then subsequently interviewed uh, Barbara Hayworth, who was the secretary for Mr. Casey and to ascertain if she had any information relevant to the issue. Um, she had been a witness at the Brennicke trial. Ms. Hayworth stated that she had no personal knowledge of Mr. Casey's involvement in the, act, in the alleged activities. Uh, we asked her if she kept his appointment calendars, saw his memos. She stated that she did. The bottom line, she had had no knowledge, did not believe he was involved. We asked her if it could have transpired without her knowledge. She said that possibility did exist, uh, and that basically is Ms. Hayworth's representations. Upon conclusion of this, we went back, as we do with all requesters, to brief them on our findings. At that time, they indicated to us that they were interested in interview of all of the Secret Service agents involved in the detail. I went back to the United States Secret Service and asked them for access to all of the agents who had been assigned to the protective uh, detail. After some discussion with the Secret Service, at that point, as discussed earlier, we were operating th under then existing policy, which was that I was not to reveal the identity of the requesting committee. Uh, since I did not do that, the Secret Service, for uh, their own reasons and for reasons conveyed to me, decided that they no longer would provide access to their employees for interview. At that point, I relayed that information back to the requester, and the decision was made to terminate the inquiry. Um, happy to entertain any questions that you have. All right. Well, why don't, <coughs> since we're in the middle of the vote, why don't we uh, recess, uh, come right back after the vote, huh? The Rules Committee will now come to order and uh, 
behalf, I, I apologize to the witnesses. I would wish the membership would return quicker, and I hope if there's another roll call that members will come right back. Uh, this could take a long time, and there may be other matters before this committee before the night is over. Uh, have you finished testifying, Ms. Mr. Chairman, during the break, I reviewed my notes, and I wanted to just mention that we had ma made one other line of inquiry, which was with Butler Aviation, which was the aircraft which we were told chartered the aircraft or serviced the aircraft involved. We checked with the current and former general managers of Butler because it has, ha has undergone new management. Um, neither one had a recollection of the event in question. Um, and the records are no longer available with Butler Aviation as to what aircraft was chartered or serviced during that period of time. Okay. Mr. Moran did state, Mr. Admiral, Rear Admiral Moran did state that no international flights took place from Butler. So. Fine. Would you speak a little louder? Okay. I can repeat that. I just stated that uh, we made an inquiry at Butler Aviation, which is where the aircraft was allegedly from where it was allegedly chartered or serviced. And both, uh, we checked with the former and current general managers. They had no specific recollection of chartering an aircraft for such an event. Uh, we asked about records that might be available during that time. The company has undergone new management, and the records are no longer maintained for that period of time. Mr. Hinchman. Uh, I think that uh, we are through, Mr. Chairman. We're available to uh, answer any questions. Okay. Well, I, I want to thank you uh, for coming up here uh, in responding to the request of the minority. Uh, and it's very rare for the GAO to, to uh, be asked to come up here. I'd just like to ask a couple of questions just for the record. Is it correct to say that the General Accounting Office functions as an independent, nonpartisan body? Yes. Okay. Do minority members have the same ability to enlist the services of the GAO as do majority members? Yes. Uh, when the General Accounting Services uh, request made by the majority for an investigation, is it obligated to inform the minority of its request, or if it's made by the minority, do you have to inform the majority? Uh, we perform uh, our work for the requesters. Uh, we leave it to them uh, to decide whether the other uh, uh, side of the aisle should be informed of the work. In many cases, uh, they elect not to do so. Okay. Was there anything about Mr. Kanye's request to GAO for an investigation that was extraordinary? There is nothing about the request that I would describe as extraordinary. You know, some concerns have been raised about the fact that you didn't provide Mr. Kanye with a written report at the end of your investigation. Could you please tell this committee why a written report wasn't made? When this was always intended to be a limited and preliminary inquiry into a much broader range of, of, of issues associated with this general claim about the so-called October surprise. When we had completed our work, and, uh, in light of its uh, preliminary uh, character, uh, we jointly agreed, uh, we and the committee, that uh, a written report would not be appropriate. And. <clears throat> And Mr. Carney's request was a very simple request. It was not for a full and complete investigation. Uh, I, it may be best to rely on the language of Would the request Would you read the language itself. of the request of Mr. Carney? I mean, the reason I'm asking this question is because uh, if you listen to some people, you think that a full investigation of the October surprise had already been made, and I'd just like to, to make it plain uh, that it wasn't. The, uh, the first paragraph uh, to the Comptroller General uh, says, and I quote, I request that your Office of Special Investigations undertake an inquiry into the facts surrounding alleged private negotiations between high-ranking officials of the 1980 Reagan-Bush presidential campaign and Iranian government officials in regard to the release of the American hostages who were being held by Iran at that time. The penultimate paragraph says that, and I quote, I would like your investigators to gather all available information to determine whether it is possible to refute Brennecke's claims and to lift the cloud that now hangs over the administration as a result of them. The obvious starting place is the transcript of the Brennecke trial and the evidence introduced thereat. 
I believe your investigators will also find useful the report issued in 1984 by the House Post Office and Civil Service Subcommittee <coughs> headed by former Congressman Albasta concerning debate gate and the theft of the Carter briefing book from the Carter White House. There is then a final uh, concluding sentence. Uh, I could suggest, Mr. Chairman, that we could provide a copy of this letter for the record at this point if it would... Uh, no, we'll accept that. But <clears throat> would it be fair to say that then your investigation was really to determine if candidate uh, our Vice President of candidate Bush at the time had left the country and was in Paris about the time that Mr. Brennicki said he was? Was, was that it about was the sum to, and substance of your investigation? It was to determine uh, whether it was possible to substantiate the allegations made by Mr. Brennicki uh, under the circumstances that Ms. Porter has described, and in particular, uh, the allegation that Mr. Bush was present at meetings uh, in Paris in a weekend exactly. in, in October. And, and you're, you found nothing? We found nothing to corroborate those allegations. Uh, obviously, the civil excuse me, the Secret Service uh, logs showing uh, President Bush in a motorcade to the Chevy Chase Country Club on the Sunday in question is evidence that, in fact, he was in Washington. Yes. Okay. Solomon. Mr. Chairman, uh, first of all, let me, let me thank uh, all of you from GAO. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. Uh, I, uh, Mr. I, I yield back uh, to I'm my sorry. time. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm very sorry. Mr. Derek. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, the three of you, for coming for testimony. We haven't heard anything from the gentleman over here on the left. Uh, all the left. But uh, thank you very much for, for coming before us. And let me, uh, would you term uh, this an investigation in the, in the true sense of the word? You use some other word and I, I, it, it skips me. You did not call it an investigation. I Mr. have uh, frequently used the term preliminary inquiry. Preliminary inquiry. Well, so uh, am I to gather from that that you, in fact, do not consider it an investigation in the sense uh, as the word investigation is generally used uh, by? I think we have used that term to try not to mislead people about whether we have conducted a full investigation into all possible aspects of the so-called October surprise. Uh, we uh, instead agreed with the committee <laughs> staff that we would conduct uh, an inquiry into certain allegations to see whether uh, there was uh, evidence available to uh, cooperate those allegations. Mr. Hickman, you're general counsel, of course, uh, a lawyer by uh, education and profession. Yes, sir. Uh, were, did did any of your investigators or, or the G did, did you have uh, uh, the uh, authority to swear people and take testimony under oath? We did not take any of this testimony under oath. Did you have subpoena power to subpoena records? No. No one that you uh, talked to was put under oath? I believe uh, I be well, none of the people that we talked to were under oath. Of course, uh, some of Mr. Brennicke's statements uh, at the, uh, the two trials in which he's involved were made under oath. Well, as a matter of fact, uh, on this trial of, of Mr. Brennicke, what you were really asked to, to look into was this trial and the allegations that uh, Mr. Brennicke made uh, that, uh, uh, that, uh, about the trips to Paris and that sort of, sort of thing. Is that right? That is essentially correct. And, yes. uh, as a result of this trial, as I understand it, uh, Mr. Brennicke was um, charged with perjury. He was actually charged with making a false statement in connection with the judicial proceeding. Yes, sir. Not a whole lot of difference, is there? No, sir. Uh, same thing. Yes, sir. Okay. Would you tell us uh, what the outcome of that charge was? Uh, he was acquitted by a jury of his peers, is that correct? Uh, or? That is my understanding. That's right. A jury found that, uh, in fact, that uh, or at least it couldn't be proved that these statements were not true that he made, that he was charged with on the perjury. Uh, a, a jury of 12 uh, uh, representatives uh, concluded he should not be convicted of the offense. I, uh, 
Now, uh, your statement uh, uh, says essentially that the U.S. attorney uh, refused to cooperate with the GAO with respect to this inquiry. Uh, U.S. attorneys are political appointments, are they not? Uh, they are appointed by the president I, for whether they are well, political they, uh, or not. Uh, Republican presidents are not in the habit of appointing Democrats, are they? I do not I know what the precise so. record well, on that is. Uh, anyway, uh, he refused to cooperate uh, with the GAO. Do you, do, do, do you know why? I wouldn't. Would you like oh, to oh, Ms. Polt, I'm sorry. Okay, I took it, Mr. O'Rourke, yes. He agreed to meet with us. Uh, it was in his offices when we asked him for access to any documentations or witnesses that he might have relevant to the case that he presented, that he made the statement that he did not wish to comment outside of the official record, in part because we would not identify who the requesting committee was for the work that we were doing. And he stated at that time that he objected to that fact. As I understand it, these perjury tri uh, charges were brought against uh, Mr. Uh, Brennecke about a year after uh, the, the Rupp uh, uh, trial. Is that right? I'm not, I can check the date on the indictment. If you can. Excuse us a moment. We ought to be accurate about this. I believe the statement was made uh, in September of 88, and uh, the copy of the indictment I have, it reads uh, May of 89, I believe, May of 89. Well, a good, a, a, a good time. Do you, do you know what did uh, the prosecutor ever indicate to you why that uh, there was this length of time uh, before the uh, actual in indictment? No, sir. He would not, uh, as I said, he would not discuss outside of that which was in the official trial record. Did uh, he ever indicate to you why, after Mr. Gregg was confirmed as his ambassador to South Korea, he offered uh, a deal in which uh, Brennecke uh, would serve no uh, time and pay no fine if he pleaded guilty? Uh, once again, sir, he would not discuss any evidence or discussions on the part of the U.S. government relative to that trial, other than what was on the official record, for the reasons I indicated. All right. You know, first let me say that I think uh, the President has said that he was not in Paris, and I believe what he says. I don't, don't question him. Uh, I may or may not have voted for him, but anyway, he's my President, and I believe that. Uh, however, I would like to, to pursue the matter, and I, I think whether he was or not is of, of no great consequence as far as the overall question that we're here to, uh, to, to do this afternoon. And, and I'm not going to try to, to go into uh, to all of the aspects of your investigation, because that's not why we're here. We're trying to determine uh, uh, there have been questions raised by the minority about the length of time, the amount of finances, the, uh, whether the former President Carter should be investigate, uh, in, included in, and so forth. Uh, you requested of the Secret Service uh, the, the right to interview each of the uh, agents that was on the detail, the President's detail of that uh, particular weekend in question. Is that right? Uh, specifically, sir, I, I believe we identified four to five individuals, the limousine driver, and so I'm not sure that it encompassed the whole detail. How many uh, people would be on a detail like that? Do you know? I cannot speak to the Secret Service uh, techniques. I understand that was, in, in my discussions with them, they indicated that they did not wish to reveal the numbers of agents that they have assigned to a protective detail because of, uh, they consider that to be proprietary information. The numbers that we were working with for potential witnesses were in the range of five to, to seven people. Now, really, you, uh, you talked with uh, Two members of this detail, yes, is sir. that right? Mr. Hudson and Mr. Teams, is that his Tannis, name? Tannis, sir. What? Tannis, T-A-N-I-S. Tannis. Mr. Tannis also uh, testified at the Brennecke trial, I believe, didn't he? Yes, sir. Uh, did Mr. Tennis mention anything about Potter Stewart and about the Chevy Chase Country Club and his testimony at the Brennecke trial? 
No, sir, to my knowledge, he did not. I do not believe he was asked that specific question. I'd have to refer to the trial transcript, which well, I can do I, that. that. But there was no statements relative to that. It would be kind of hard for me to believe in a trial that you're trying to determine where someone is and he's out there and that, that, that statement wouldn't be asked. I, I have to look at the trial transcript specifically. I believe at that time uh, Mr. Tennis or Mr. Hudson had no specific recollection of the, the time period involved. When I did the interview of Mr. Tennis, I had for my benefit the use of the Secret Service documents which I asked him to review and, and describe to me if this was his signature and the dates and all of that. So he had the benefit of that information in front of him when I interviewed him. We had the records, so to speak. But in, a, in, in any of uh, in, in he, this was, he did not testify to this at the Brennecke trial. This was something that he told you later. Is that right? He did not, in other words, he did not testify to this under oath even at the Brennecke trial. Uh, sir, once again, I have to review the transcript, but I don't, I know this issue did not surface at the Brennecke trial, but I do not believe that the specific question related to where were you at the country club or any of that surfaced at that trial on either side, either the defense or the prosecution. Well, did Mr. Hudson mention the Chevy Chase Country Club or, 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 or Justice Potter Stewart or, or, or at the uh, Brennecke trial when yes, he testified? Sir. Did you ever interview Mrs. Potter Stewart? No, we did not. Uh, why not? I had discussions in, I believe it was the December time frame, um, with staff on the subcommittee. I was directed at that point. In my discussions with them, we discussed uh, alternatives as how to pursue a verification of the event. We decided that we would pursue the, secret, the um, Chevy Chase Country Club documentation and the Potter Stewart. At that point, the statement was made to me that uh, as an alternative approaching Mrs. Potter Stewart, if she was in possession of the records, she was not in possession of the records at that time, and so we did not pursue that lead. And you don't know why the subcommittee made that determination? Why they made what determination, sir? Uh, you not to go forward with that? I believe we mutually discussed it. Um, at that point, I did not know the age or health of Mrs. Potter Stewart that was discussed. We speculated on the possibility that she may be elderly. And so once again, that was, that was discussed in light of other investigative leads. And when I left that meeting and in subsequent conversations with the staff, the agreement was that we would attempt to to find the records that Mr. Potter Stewart maintained for that period of time, and that is precisely what we did. Did this committee ever investigate the uh, political and military situation in Iran after the Shah fell in the late 1970s? To which committee, sir? Your committee. I can't comment. I don't know. I mean, I mean, your investigation. Did it? Did oh, it, did we look at the yeah. issues relative? Mm -hmm. No. Mm -hmm. To the Shah in Iran? Yeah. No, sir. It was not in the scope of our of our inquiry uh, request. Did you ever investigate uh, whether arm sales were made to Iran e at, at any time, either in 1980 or throughout the uh, 1980s, by this country? No, sir. It was not within the scope of our inquiry. Did you ever investigate whether they were made by Israel? No, sir. To Iran? No, sir. Did you ever investigate as to why, within minutes after President Reagan was uh, uh, inaugurated in 1980, that the plane started taking off from the Iranian airport uh, with the hostages aboard? Did you ever investigate that? No, sir. I repeat, the scope of our inquiry was the Brennecke allegations and uh, the I, leads from that. I understand. Uh, did you ever look at any bank transfers of any money uh, between Iran and other people in this country? And so yes, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and, and of course, the point that I'm trying to make is that, in fact, your investigation, and I, I use the word investigation qualifiedly, was or either you looked into a very narrow area that could or could not be connected with the overall investigation. Would that be a fair statement? I mean, you looked into the matter of the Brennecke trial and the statements that Brennecke made, and that was the extent of your investigation. And natural investigative lead that stemmed from those statements. So 
there were, as I indicated, other leads that we did pursue. What but I think we have character, as I described earlier, um, I think it is fair to characterize it as a limited inquiry into specific issues over the five-month period of time. But you would in no way characterize it as a uh, inquiry into the so-called October surprise, would you? As a to an inquiry into all the facts and events surrounding that alleged event, no, sir. Well, would you characterize it into a, as, a, as a, a, an inquiry into a large part of the October surprise? It, it seems to me difficult to, to decide how big the universe outside our inquiry is. I don't think Well, of course, what I'm trying to, I'm sorry, I beg your pardon, I didn't mean to interrupt you. That's quite all right. Please go ahead, Mr. Conn. You know, what I'm trying to establish is that, in fact, uh, that, uh, that, that what you did was a minuscule part of some of the allegations that have been made about arms transfers and deals and all that sort of stuff. I mean, you didn't get into any of that. Is that correct? All, what you did was to try to establish if uh, someone was telling the truth who said they had been in Paris and uh, had, uh, and uh, I think it, Mr. Brennicky didn't ever say that he saw the president over there. He just said that Mr. Rupp told him that he saw somebody on the uh, tarmac that he thought was 98% sure that that's probably who it was. That's correct. But Brennicky himself never made the statement that he had seen him or that the president was uh, any part of any meeting, did he? No, sir. He never claimed firsthand knowledge. And so, and I'm, I'm going to wind it up here in just a second, but you know, what, I, what I'm trying to do is, we're here not to determine whether the facts are, are true or false, but what, we're tr what I'm trying to, to get at is that what you dealt with was a very small part of the overall picture. Is that correct? I, I would, I only hesitate because I don't know how to characterize the division of the universe. We dealt with precisely the issues which we described. To the extent that there are other issues uh, known to those concerned about this matter, uh, which are not part of the, in the inquiry we have described, uh, we did not address those. Well, you don't think that you, I mean, you don't in any way think that you could make a judgment on these allegations of, of whether there was an arms deal in, 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 uh, between the Reagan uh, campaign team and uh, the Iranian government at that time from your investigation? We could not make such a judgment. All right, all right, good. All right. Let me, one, one minute, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate your indulgence. Just from your, uh, Ms. Volta, just, just from your investigation, would you, would you think it's fair that if we are to go into this, this matter, that it is going to be in an in-depth investigation and it's going to take a lot of time and effort in the overall picture, but just based on the small part of it that you were involved in? I think, sir, that is dependent upon what you determine to be the objectives and scope of your inquiry, and that naturally will determine what type of resources and time will be involved. I, you know, if you decide you want to look at specific issues or the whole, well, all of the allegations. Assuming that, that the objective is that, uh, to try to find out if, in fact, there was some sort of deal or, or consideration or understanding between the Reagan campaign team in, in, in 1980 and the Iranian government relative to the release of the hostages. I mean, let's say that's the objective. I mean, would you say that it's going to take a, a large effort of Mr. Hickman? Maybe you would rather answer that yourself. I mean, I based on, that, on... I think that anyone who has looked at this issue would say that that was a substantial and difficult undertaking, particularly in light of the a considerable amount of time which has elapsed since those events. Uh, there are people and records which are no longer available, and the task will not be easy. That, right. however, I should say, does not answer the question, and nor do I mean to suggest answer the question, of whether it should be undertaken. I understand that. But would you think if, if, if those are the objective, objectives that it is going to take a great deal of time and, and effort and money? Thank you. As I said, I think it is a difficult undertaking. Yes. Okay. Once again, I thank you all very much for coming and appearing before us, and you've been most helpful. 
and, and uh, will play a large part, I'm sure, in whatever decision this committee comes to. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Derrick. Mr. Solomon. To enlighten my good, good friend, uh, who has a, a last name first and, and vice versa, uh, <laughs> Mr. Mr. Derrick, my good friend. I think to answer the question, when I met within a private meeting with you and them the other day, uh, I believe it was Mr. Hinchman that said it was on the magnitude of the Iran-Contra thing. Uh, and God knows how many millions of dollars that was. Uh, as I listened to my good friend Butler Derrick, uh, ask these questions. Uh, I have to recall that I spent many years on the Foreign Affairs Committee. And I couldn't help but uh, think back to the, uh, to the report that you folks gave us on all the meetings that you had. Uh, and a name kept popping up. And that name also was a man who had a last name first and vice versa. His name was Spencer Oliver. You know, not Oliver Spencer, but Spencer Oliver. And any time in the past 10 years when I was on the Foreign Affairs Committee and we found a movement out there to undermine Reagan Bush American foreign policy, this name popped up out of nowhere, a name that people never see in public but who's always back there somewhere. And lo and behold, here it comes again. I'm going to uh, yield to my good friend uh, Bob McEwen, who is a member of the uh, uh, of the Intelligence Committee for many years and who is going to really manage this markup and, uh, and this issue and let him ask mm. the questions. Uh, but I want to thank you people and particularly Ms. Porter because you really do impress me. I mean, you, you do a tremendous job and too bad we can't steal you away from GAO and bring you over here where we can really put your talents to use. And, uh, why don't but, you, uh, why don't you, why don't you, you want to hire you? Why don't you, from, why don't you subpoena her? Huh? <laughs> will, you, will, you, that, will that work? Uh, but let, me, let me yield to my good friend, uh, to Bob McEwen, and let him uh, lead off the questions from our side. I just have a statement. Oh, I'd be matter. glad to yield to you. Uh, you mentioned Spencer Oliver earlier. Yes. There's also Spencer Oliver's desk uh, that was bugged at Watergate. Uh -huh. uh, like I say, he's out there. Nobody ever sees him, but his name keeps popping up. Well, the, uh, apparently the Nixon um, crowd, at least, were keeping tracks of him. Well, Mr. Chairman, I move that we that we expand this to an investigation of Mr. Nixon. <laughs> <laughs> He's still alive. <laughs> unlike I think Mr. The gentleman from Ohio is getting very political. Uh, unlike, Mi <laughs> unlike Mr. Khomeini and these other folks that are dead, at least we could talk to Nixon. And uh, the investigation was the question was posed a little bit ago: a large effort to find out if the campaign Reagan team had made a deal and all that. And truth of the matter, we could go to any of them tomorrow, subpoena them, get their statement on the record, and we'd f we'd find out whether or not they did it. I mean, if that, if that were our goal, we could do that probably in a, in a day. But I'll begin, by, as I said privately, and as the others have said thus far, how very very impressed. Uh, I am personally with the effort that you had made. I mean, here you have these Inspector Clouseaus that have come up with all these stories and how you chased them down to try to find some wit of, of uh, correlation that uh, they were in these places and then you ask them uh, what was the weather and, and then you could go to the meteorological reports and find out that that was a false story and what airplane did you use and well, you ought to have a tail number and so you go check the tail numbers and find out they weren't telling. I, I am impressed at, at, the, at the myriad of ways at which you came at it to, to find your conclusions. Let me uh, go through a, a series as to how you got started. You mentioned in your opening statement that the official request came from Chairman Conyers and that several meetings were held with the subcommittee and a staff representative of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Can you share with us who the representative of the House Foreign Affairs Committee was? That was Mr. Oliver. Uh, Spencer Oliver? Yes, sir. Uh, and have you received any oral or written requests from the chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee that he participate or that the Foreign Affairs Committee participate in the inquiry that you were conducting here? Uh, not to my knowledge. Uh, so do you have any idea how uh, Mr. Oliver's involvement came about? That is not something of which we have uh, any knowledge. Was it the nature of Mr. Oliver's involvement given the fact that the request for the investigation was coming from the Government Operations Committee uh, novel to you at all or raise any questions or you were just whoever they invited to participate was up to them I guess. We uh, perform uh, our work for requesters uh, and uh, we brief them on the progress of our work and it's up to them to determine within reasonable limits of course who should be present and if they in some cases decide that 
staff members, some other committees or, or personal staff of members should be there. That's not unusual. Did he seek to direct the investigation or make suggestions as to where you, you could go in the course of the investigation or what was his involvement at this point? I think uh, it would be fair to describe him as among the active participants in those meetings. But there were others as well. Uh -huh. You mentioned about the request and that the conduction, the, certainly these interviews and, and uh, uh, discussions and meetings were held prior to the written request. How did the request first come to GAO prior to the written request? We uh, were approached uh, by the staff and, and asked to meet with them to discuss uh, some work they had in mind. Was Mr. Oliver a participant in that request? I believe he was yes. present at that meeting, yes, which occurred in June prior to the July letter from Mr. Conyers. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he was present at the creation then? Uh, yes, sir. A at least at the June 14th meeting. Mm -hmm. And that, I is this unusual to begin investigations without written requests? We uh, frequently uh, begin investigations without a written request on behalf of, uh, of members uh, both of, uh, on both sides of the aisle. Uh, our policy is that we prefer written requests. Sure. And in fact, in this case, because of the sensitivity of the work, we did think that uh, a written request would be uh, appropriate. Uh, and of course, Mr. Conyers provided it. There came a time when, when you made your report and they eventually decided that, you know, enough already. Let's, let's draw the curtain on this. Uh, did Mr. Oliver concur in that decision to terminate the investigation? I spoke with... Um the requester contact, who at that time um, was Amit uh, Pandey, and Amit Pandey, uh, after our last formal meeting, which was, I believe, January 10th, and the decision to pursue the Secret Service uh, interviews, and I relayed, after my several discussions with Secret Service, the information back to him, he indicated to me during those conversations that he was in consultation with Mr. Oliver. So based on that representation, I did not personally speak with Mr. Oliver during that time frame, but I am assuming on that basis that he wasn't a, a party to the decision. But I this is out comment. of sequence, but it reminds me of something that was posed. Uh, Justice Potter Stewart is now dead, and his wife is, is ill, and I commend you on being able to check all the myriad of other examples as to whether or not that meeting took place, such as the Secret Service logs, as well as the public <laughs> statements in the Post, and, and to, not, uh, to not bother her for a preliminary investigation of this sort. Um, so we have no way of knowing. Uh, the, the suggestion that enough has been done came then from this. Uh, I think we ought at GAO to take responsibility for the decision to bring uh, this matter to a close. Obviously, while we do try to shape our work to meet the requirements of our requesters, and they help us define the task, in the final analysis, how we conduct that work, and what the result of it is, is something for which we're responsible. And, and I would describe that as our judgment, although I, I do think it's fair to say that there was consensus about that. Has outcome. Mr. Oliver been involved since that decision to terminate the investigation? Has he contacted I, I have, you? Um, yes, I did provide, as we have, to anybody who requested a briefing on this issue. Uh, let me check the date here, but I, June, was it June 5th? Yes, on June 5th of this year, uh, Mr. Oliver was provided a formal briefing. Is that, is that the, the total of his involvement at this point? After my last contact with the requester, which was uh, a telephonic contact, uh, in the end of February, I had no further contact with any of the parties until uh, I think there may have been a phone call after there was a Washington Times article, but essentially, yes, I, there was no continued dialogue, the request for a briefing. Thank you. So after these, at these meetings, after these government operations meetings, and then we have uh, Mr. Oliver from Foreign Affairs, uh, I understand that there was also a cadre of, of journalists that were invited as well. Did you maintain a list as to who they were? In the June time frame, uh, June, no, excuse me, I was not the uh, case agent at this time. In the July time frame, 
the subcommittee staff uh, represented to OSI that there were three individuals with information on the issue at hand. And so, yes, I did maintain that information. But, but I wish to be clear that that meeting was not one for the purpose of, of GAO or OSI providing information to those journalists. Uh, it was an opportunity for us to obtain information from them and to make whatever use of it uh, proved appropriate in the course of the investigation. I understand. Do you mind telling us who they were? Uh, are you in a position to do that? Yes, I believe so. Yeah. Um, they were uh, Martin Killian from Der Spiegel, Gary Sick, um, and Bob Perry, I believe. Okay. Getting back to the investigation, other than the written request by Mr. Conyers, did you ever have an occasion to brief him on the progress of the investigation? Uh, we did not, but I should be clear that in the course of our work, we seldom deal directly with members. We almost always deal with staff, and we leave it to the really? staff to decide when the member uh, should uh, be involved. Often that does not occur until the work is concluded and, for example, a hearing takes place. Did he ever ask for a written report? Uh, I do not believe so, no. Uh, so we don't know whose decision it was to not issue a final written report? Uh, it was our decision not to issue a final Due to the fact report. that he hadn't requested one? Fine. No, I, I think it was our decision that was the appropriate way to terminate the work under the circumstances. Good. Uh, yeah, you're done fine. Um, we've been told that uh, to, to do an October surprise investigation would, would cost something on the scale of Iran Contra, which uh, cost millions of dollars. Uh, is that an accurate assessment of the scale you think this should would take in order to chase down? I mean, actually, there is no. He could come up, these guys could come up with ideas like sparks off a flywheel. You really couldn't chase all of them down short of the U.S. Treasury. Um, let me ask this. If you're putting together a story and you're trying to, trying to shape it out, there ought to be something in there that, that clicks. In all of these allegations, what actually was true that you can confirm from your investigation? When you say all of these allegations, do you mean the Well, the, the fact that he stopped in all these places and who was flying the plane and they saw George Bush and it was in Madrid and then it was in Paris. And all, of all of these things that they've all said, and you've chased them all down, by accident, by sheer chance of, of error, one of them might have turned up to be true. Uh, did you ever find one? Was he ever in any of these places? Was there a passport stamp? Did he ever go to the hotel? Did he, it was ever Mr. Brennick, you mean? Yeah, and either he or up either one. Uh, the information provided to us did not indicate that uh, Mr. Brennick was present at those. However, there was very limited documentation provided to us relevant to that issue. In fact, at one point he said, when you got him down at the hotel and you said, well, you would have had it, there would have been a claim check or something, he said, well, I recognized the girl behind the counter, and so I didn't check in or something. Uh, when we asked uh, Mr. Brennicky for, we were going to check, pursue the issue of the hotel registration, he made in his statements to me that he and Martin Killian had traveled to Europe, uh, had attempted to check the records at the hotel during that period in question, that it was a hit or miss proposition during those time frames for availability of those records, and they were not available and further that he knew the individual behind the desk when he checked in. Uh, it was a woman whose name he could not remember. For that reason, he did not register. Forgive me. Um, I've asked this question three times, and I don't want to lead you at all, but basically I'm just, at any time in any of these investigations, did anything they ever say turn out to be true? Isn't it more accurate, I think, to summarize the results of our work to say that we did not find any evidence to corroborate Mr. Brennicky's allegations? So, so unless you were the United States government and the Congress of the United States, chances are you'd think that this was probably a pretty dry hole, I guess. Okay, that's an observation on my part. We were also told that the uh, further investigation to be thorough, it would be important to know about the contemporaneous efforts by the Carter administration to secure the release of the hostages as the Senate has done. Uh, is it correct in your judgment that this would, would be logical to include in the course of this investigation? I think that that's a judgment which those who are responsible for uh, reaching the decision before you need to make. Well said, Counselor. Uh, 
thank you all very, very much. Thank you. <coughs> the Honorable Alan Wheat. Mr. Chairman, just a couple of brief questions. Uh, once again, let me thank you for your uh, professionalism and your patience in going through this process. And of course, we are not the committee judge with the ultimate responsibility of exploring the entire fact situation and making any kind of determination as to what happened or what didn't happen. But in attempting to, to set up the committee, let me just very briefly go back over the scope of your initial inquiry. As I understand it, it was limited to two very narrow subject areas, uh, the truth of the Brinicky, uh allegations in regard to a trip to Europe being one, and the possibility that uh, then candidate, now President Bush, uh, would have been on that trip, and, and so you expanded your investigation to cover the President's whereabouts the weekend of October the 19th. That, that is a good summary of, of our and, and that's, that's the scope, of the, the, basically the entire scope of your inquiry. Uh, in, in terms of trying to make a determination as to the kinds of resources, time, and effort that would be necessary for a much expanded uh, inquiry if we, if we choose to undertake one, can, can you go back over how long your inquiry into these two narrow areas took? The request uh, was received in July of 90. The specific actual the legwork was basically done from September until January with follow-up phone calls into February. So that was the time frame uh, of the effort. And I believe uh, we calculated what, 85. I believe that the, we calculated 85 staff days to do that work. Approximately 80 st 85 staff days spread over a uh, six to seven month time period. That's correct. So it, it would be fair to assume that if the in inquiry were expanded exponentially that the, the, the time uh, and the uh, money necessary for the in investigation would also expand. Uh, that I would assume so, yes sir. Uh, there are some suggestions that ultimately there can never be any conclusions that come from this kind of investigation, but you and I take it the, uh, the requesters, uh, the Government Operations Committee who originally asked you to undertake this inquiry, uh, did essentially come to the conclusion that, that uh, you could find no evidence to corroborate the fact that the President was in Paris or in Madrid at the time the, uh, at the, time the, alle at, at the, time the uh, allegation suggests he was there. I, I don't mean to quibble. I, as I said, we had a preliminary inquiry, and our conclusion is that we found no evidence. For, for, for those of us who are not attorneys or investigators, uh, we would basically assume that you found that the president wasn't in Paris that weekend of October the 19th. Uh, and, and that that would be a conclusion that could be drawn from your efforts. The, the affirmative evidence uh, which we found of course does show uh, then vice presidential candidate Bush uh, in Washington DC on that weekend. That's correct. And to the, to the degree that that would be a portion of the investigation or if in fact that were the essence of the entire investigation that would have indicated uh, that there would have been some purpose uh, to, uh, mm -hmm. to, to the uh, inquiry that you have undertaken. There's no question about that, yes sir. Thank you very much. I appreciate all the time that you, you put into this. Ms. Slaughter? Uh, Mr. Quillen, I'm sorry. I passed her several times. No, well, actually, the reason we'll bypass the first time, Mr. Quillen, is because Mr. Solomon yielded to Mr. McHugh. I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> thank you both for being here. I thank you. It's a remarkable memory you have, uh, Ms. Porter. I congratulate you. I'm wondering now that, uh, Mr. Henchman, you work for the committee as chief counsel? Uh, no, sir. I am the general counsel of GAO. And you, uh, do you uh, work for the majority or minority? Uh, I work for the general accounting office. Uh, I am not directly accountable to the committee on either the majority or the minority side. Instead, I report to Mr. Bauscher, uh, who, for whom the Government Operations Committee provides oversight. And you're the Special Agent, Office of Special Investigations? Yes, sir. The Office of Special Investigations is part of the General Accounting Office 
and in fact is is in the area of responsibility of the general counsel. And in your investigation, I know that you had a mandate and probably a completion date. What was the mandate uh, in conclusion for you to make a written report as to your conclusion uh, uh, after investigating? We had agreed that uh, in, in this case uh, we would discuss the appropriate way to conclude the investigation once the work had been done. Uh, at that point, uh, we felt that given its preliminary uh, character, a written report would not be appropriate. The committee uh, concurred in that decision. Well, what was the purpose of your investigation? The purpose was to was see... It, was it political? Uh, no, sir. It was to see whether uh, there was evidence uh, which could corroborate uh, the allegations which Mr. Brennicky had made regarding this October meeting uh, in Paris uh, with the Iranian government. Requested by the chairman? Yes, sir. When on the committee itself, do you know whether or not the minority staff members, which you have referred to staff members before, uh, were any of the minority staff members brought into the investigation? Uh, it, it, I do not know for certain whether they were brought in. They did not participate in our meetings with the committee staff, and it is my understanding uh, that they were not brought in. Uh, Ms. Porter, you referred to, uh, re referred to staff members. In your conversation with staff members of the committee, did you talk with any of the minority members? No, sir. <coughs> I met only with the requesting staff, and it was the... Uh, there was no and minority you, representative. And uh, you, then, Mr. Hanschman, uh, in dealing with investigation, and I don't think that's right. I think we're here today bringing up an, investi bringing up an investigation which the... Uh, events probably occurred 10 years ago, if in fact they did occur. And bringing it here without the minority knowing in the committee anything about it, not informed, and you're, uh, you're carrying out the mandate of the committee, I just wonder now in all your deliberations, if it ever occurred to you that we're doing this for the majority of the committee rather than the whole committee itself. Did that ever occur to you, if Ms. I Porter <coughs> or Mr. Henchman? Uh, we, of course, were aware of that. That is a common characteristic of the work that we do. I will say in this case that once the work uh, was complete and, and knowledge of the work uh, became more widespread, uh, we were asked to provide briefings uh, to both majority and minority staffs of several committees. Uh, we have done so always with the support of Mr. Conyers. Well, Mr. Conyers is a fine man. I'm not being critical, but I, it looks like we're going to embark on an investigation which has a partisan uh, flavor, and I don't think that's right for the benefit of the American people. I'm only trying to establish that it occur to you, Ms. Porter, that this was a partisan investigation. Sir, every inquiry that I've undertaken at OSI... I can't hear you. Every inquiry that I have undertaken at OSI is done as a specific request of, com of a specific chairman or committee. And rather that be minority or majority, I don't, I don't weigh it well, politically. Not, uh, I believe you said you dealt with staff members. Yes, but the request is usually signed and by... And you're a, dealing with staff members. Were they of the majority or of the minority? The request was from the, major from the chairman, and I was dealing with majority staff. Is that your recollection, too, Mr. Uh, uh, there is no question but that that was characteristic of all of our dealings with the committee on this work. As I said, that we have many jobs uh, like that. We have other jobs which we are performing for members of the minority in which the majority is not involved. But I'm not being critical. I'm trying to establish a point that I think the American people ought to know whether or not this is turning out to be a partisan investigation. I appreciate the good work you do, uh, really, and I'm amazed, Ms. Porter, at your memory. And I look forward to reading your testimony, which I have not read. And 
thank you. I have no further questions. Thank you. The Honorable David Dry of California. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I uh, made my opening statement and all, and I just want to really follow up on one point that was raised. I, was, I understand, Ms. Porter, that someone here, I had to take a phone call, had asked about the involvement of a Foreign Affairs Committee staff member called Spencer Oliver uh, and uh, his involvement in, in this. Did someone ask you that today? or? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. You did? No, Mr. McEwen. Oh, Mr. McEwen did. I just, I, and I understand that you had provided an answer. What I wanted to ask was whether or not there were other members of the panel uh, here today who are aware of any kind of involvement that Mr. Oliver might have uh, had at all on the October surprise issue following the time that you said you had last had contact with him. I don't know how I can address yeah, I don't, that. I don't th actually, I don't think you should be the one to answer that. Uh, uh, because Gentleman Yield. Happy to yield the chairman. Are you asking, does, did any member of this committee have any no, no, knowledge? No, no, this panel. Oh, I'm oh, sorry. I thought you meant this I'm, panel there. I meant this panel there, okay. the, this one that I'm looking to. I was just wondering if uh, maybe Mr. Gherkins, if you knew of any involvement that, that he might have had on the October surprise issue with either members of this body or the other body dealing with this issue. I believe he did uh, attend a meeting that uh, we, um, where we pr presented basically this briefing to uh, Senator Sanford's uh, staff, and Mr. Spencer Albert was in attendance at that meeting as well. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, I couldn't hear that one. We presented this briefing to Senator Stanford, Sanford's uh, staff uh, some weeks ago. At that meeting, Spencer Oliver was in attendance. He's a House Foreign Affairs Committee staff member, is that right? <laughs> That's that's correct. Okay. And, I'm not present. and he and he was attending the briefing that was provided to a member of the other body's staff. I see. Excuse me. You might just ask whose payroll is he on? Well, I think we need to. he's is he works on the but he works for the staff of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. I assume that that's the committee. That that's our understanding, but I I defer to the to the House. Uh, Are any of the rest of you aware of any other? Um, involvement that he might have had with the October surprise issue following the meeting that you uh, referred to earlier? None that comes to mind at this time. Uh, if it does, we'll certainly provide it for the record. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And if this panel wants to answer the question, you're welcome to. No, I, I thought the, the way you were questioned whether we had any advanced knowledge of right. Mr. Oliver. Right. Uh, <clears throat> I really want to thank you very much. I know it's been a long day and it's been some of the questions have been repeated over and over again and I thank you very much for, for your indulgence and uh, you're very helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank Mr. You. Chairman. <clears throat> the next witness will be Mr. Frank Askin, consultant to the Subcommittee on Legislation and National Security. Obviously, Mr. Frank. Maybe it's running late. I'm going to read it now. Okay. Since you know, Mr. Chairman, would you mind asking Mr. Spencer Oliver is in the room? <laughs> uh, since uh, Mr. Askin's not here, I'd like at this time uh, to read a letter uh, from the uh, from Chairman John Conyers. <clears throat> Dear Mr. Chairman, thank you for your letter requesting that the Committee on Government Operations provide information relative to H.R.E.S. 258 to provide funding for a task force to investigate allegations that members of the Reagan-Bush presidential campaign team were involved in negotiations with representatives of the Iranian government to delay the release of American hostages until after the presidential election of 1980. I believe that the limited information in the possession of the committee at this point argues in favor of the resolution. In addition, I understand that some members of the Rules Committee have made what I consider to be an unprecedented request that a consultant to the Committee on Government Operations be called as a witness as he was the point of contact for a brief and limited GAO review conducted for the Committee on this matter. As I have explained to those members, this is unacceptable to me. I believe it would be a highly unwise precedent for committees of the Congress other than the Committee of Standards of Official Conduct to begin calling the staffs of other members and committees to question them about the work they're doing and for what committee or member. 
Staff members of committees do not speak for committees. To begin demanding that they testify before other committees would, in my judgment, injure the comedy and processes of the institution and would compromise the integrity of the investigative process. Requests for relevant information should be directed to the chairman and members of a committee in Congress. Curiously, this request is based on an alleged quote of this staff consultant, which is inaccurate, made by an author whose credibility has been repeatedly questioned, and further, the members of the Rules Committee requesting the appearance of the staff consultant have rejected an offer to even discuss the matter with him. I find this highly disturbing, and I believe it may raise questions about the motivation of the request. As you know, in July of 1990, the Committee on Government Operations Subcommittee on National Security asked the General Accounting Office to conduct preliminary review, limited both in time and scope, related to the above-mentioned allegation. Because of the lack of cooperation, the work could not be completed, and no report was ever issued. The review followed the acquittal of Mr. Richard Brennecke of perjury charges in April of 1990 by a Portland, Oregon jury. Mr. Brennecke was charged with a perjury, with perjury for having claimed that he had attended a meeting in Paris in the latter part of October 1980 between representatives of the Reagan-Bush campaign and Iranian government representatives. The core of the perjury charges were his sworn allegations that the meeting occurred and was attended by Mr. Donald Gregg, Mr. William Casey, and other representatives of, Mr. of the Reagan-Bush campaign team. The government's inability to disprove Mr. Brennecke's rather astounding allegations by members of the 1980 Reagan-Bush campaign appeared to raise important questions. It is, unclear, it is unclear why the Department of Justice did not produce evidence to convince the jury the claims were untrue. Following the trial, the jury foreman publicly indicated that he actually believed the allegations. The limited nature of the GAO review was largely to ascertain the information about what would appear to be easily obtainable records in order to refute, as I indicated in my letter to GAO, the allegations which gained some credence after the trial. Because the United States Attorney did not cooperate, cooperate with the review, nor would the Secret Service produce for interviews the staff members of the Secret Service detail for a relevant time period, the GAO work was never completed and no report was ever issued. Further, the review was concluded prior to the publication in the New York Times of April of 1991 of an op-ed article by former Carter aide Gary Sick, which has since generated numerous calls for a formal congressional investigation. The characterization that this review constituted a, a dis disposition is highly misleading. The bulk of the alleged evidence that such negotiations involving the Reagan-Bush campaign team with the Iranians to, del to delay the hostage review was never reviewed by the GAO. There was no travel by the GAO abroad to where the meetings were said to have taken place, no interviews with those who were said to be principally involved, no investigations as to the alleged arms shipments, no requests for cables, no subpoenas, and no depositions. In short, even a review highly limited in scope was inconclusive. Finally, I've been made aware that there was concern that this review was confidential. The purpose for maintaining confidentiality was to avoid fueling additional speculation and give credence to the allegations in the absence of further substantiation. Members of the minority are fully entitled to the same such procedures of confidentiality should they choose to exercise them. I hope this information is useful to you as you and the committee consider H. Res. 258. Sincerely, John Conyers, Jr., Chairman. Ask the members consent to be placed on the record. Mr. Uh, Chairman. Mr. Solomon. <laughs> In regard to that uh, correspondence from uh, Chairman Conyers, who I will repeat, I have the greatest respect for, and uh, uh, I can understand his uh, his. Uh, protecting his committee's rights. Uh, as a member of this committee, I have for a number of years uh, defended the rights of individual authorizing committees. Uh, we've been blocking, as a matter of fact, a defense authorization bill from going to the floor uh, that usurps the, the authority of the Foreign Affairs Committee by giving a billion dollars in foreign aid under the, under the uh, defense budget uh, to the Soviet, uh, former Soviet Union. But uh, 
Mr. Uh, Conyers, in his meeting with us, uh, knows that his committee had subpoenaed and had uh, uh, obtained the, the testimony from a member of the post office and uh, a staff member of the post office and civil services committee. Uh, he knows the presence there, and we we cited uh, well, uh, earlier on. The gentleman yelled. I'd the the member was never subpoenaed. He happened to be in the audience when someone oh. asked him to testify. No subpoena was ever okay. issued. And, and he, he just did. happened to be in the audience and someone said, do you know anything about this? Would you please, do you mind testifying? And the fellow says, no, and he came up to the table. Well, it would have been very nice, Mr. Chairman, if, uh, if uh, Mr. Askin could have been in the audience and we could have invited him up <laughs> and let him enlighten us, uh, for the record. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, I have uh, also would like to make a unanimous request to uh, submit various material, which consists of uh, correspondence back and forth between you and I, between our, our Republican leader, Mr. Michael, and the Speaker, uh, and uh, including Mr. Horton's response to that letter from uh, his counterpart, Mr. Conyers, uh, that you just read a few minutes ago, in which Mr. Horton had no objection to, uh, to that contract consultant coming before this committee and giving us the benefit of his uh, knowledge on this issue. And, Without uh, objection, the gentleman uh, made. So I would submit all of this information uh, for, for the record. Without, Mr. Derrick. Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to uh, include in the record a, a letter uh, from you to the Honorable John Conyers, Chairman of the Committee on Government Operations, on the date of November 1, 1991, and a uh, letter uh, from you, a copy of a letter from you to the Honorable Charles A. Bauscher, Com Comptroller General of the United States, under date of November the 1st, 1991, and also a set of uh, various articles, editorials, news, uh, uh, magazine articles uh, presented to the... Yield? Yes. I just wanted to ask about, I, I had, you sent that to me, I guess, and all the other members of the committee. No, no, they, they were delivered to your offices last night. I, and I was very happy to personally. receive them. I had, and you personally delivered them? No, I didn't personally deliver oh. them. <laughs> but if I'd known you had wanted it, I would have. Well, I was, I was happy to have a chance to read it, and I've just gone through the article um, that was written by Abby Hoffman. I remember him very well. As being the gentleman is in the middle of a motion. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm so such a long he lengthy motion. Uh, well, he's consent. But, and I, I, I would further like uh, ask unanimous I'm consent sorry, to, uh, uh, to include in the record these various articles uh, on the date of November the uh, 6th, 1991. Uh, uh, presented Sorry, objection. I guess should I reserve the right to object yeah. to ask him a couple of questions? Sure. Okay. Reserving the right to object. And I don't plan to object. In fact, I look forward to having that entered into the record, Mr. Chairman. But I do so just to ask uh, my friend, uh, as I looked at this, I was unaware of exactly where this article came from, the way it came out in the package, the uh, Abby Hoffman mm -hmm. article. And I was wondering if my friend might tell us where Abby Hoffman's article was. It carried. was in Playboy magazine. Playboy magazine. Yeah, I, I've since found that out. Um, now, Abby Hoffman, Abby Hoffman. I'm glad that that's the article you're reading when you were looking at that playbook. Right. <laughs> that's exactly right. Well, it, came, it came from the Library of Congress, I should say, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, well, I thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I can't say anything more after that. Sure. Any, uh, Jerry? Excuse me. We're, uh, through. Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, earlier in the day, uh, we had discussed a, uh, a motion of mine to uh, it was it, it was there. to obtain the, uh, the uh, Rules Committee uh, majority vote on a subpoena for Mr. Frank Askin, who is a contract consultant uh, for the uh, Government Operations Committee, which we've discussed here today. Without going into that debate, we know what it's all about, and I would at this time so move that motion to subpoena Mr. Uh, Askin to appear before this committee. And because the answer that I've already read in the letter from uh, Chairman John Conyers, and uh, uh, because it would be a precedent-setting matter, uh, I oppose it. Question comes on the motion of the gentleman from New York. I'm sorry, Mr. Weiss. I'm very I, I, sorry. I'm sorry. Could I just ask Mr. Solomon one question sure. about sure. this matter? Can, I listened very carefully to the letter you read from Mr. Conyers, and he seemed to make a number of impressive arguments, though I, I think it would be 
quite frankly, I, I would like to hear the testimony of Mr. Eskin, though I, I understand what it would be, because he's indicated that there's, there's very little that he could say. But Mr. Conyer said the appropriate person to, to invite to, to give this information uh, would be him as the chairman of the committee. And I know you, Mr. Solomon, that you met with Mr. Conyers. Was there any discussion about inviting the, the chairman to, to attend? Yes, there was. And, and uh, Chairman Moakley, in the letter that I just uh, unanimously uh, uh, submitted for the record, invited Mr. Mo Mr. Uh, Conyers or his designee to appear, and he chose not to. But also, let, let me if, just, if, if I may, at that time, uh, Mr. Conyers agreed to appear informally uh, before the, the members in Tulip because he uh, said that the, 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 the gentleman, the staff person uh, was misquoted. He'd never made the statement. And, and and, an informal procedure the similar to the one that we had the other day when the GAO people were here. Gentleman's correct. Provided much of the same information to us at correct. that time that, that they provided today. And, and that would be unsatis unsatisfactory to you? It was, it was uh, no, I'd be more than glad to meet with Mr. Conyers, which I did at his request. I came over and met privately well, if, with him. If that in informal procedure would be satisfactory in terms of actually getting the information, why press this point on the subpoena today? Because we need to go for the record and be on the record. Uh, uh, Mr. Weech, you know that uh, this whole thing came from this whole litany of articles which, uh, which it were uh, instigated again uh, by... I, I, I wouldn't want you to characterize my knowledge on this matter. I'm really trying to, to come to an understanding of, of, of what we should do and why we should do it. No. But, and it seems to me that it would be appropriate to have Mr. Conyers come in informally if he has made that offer, and just like we did with the GAO. And if after we listen to him informally, you still want to go ahead and press some formal process, let's do it. But until that time, I, I wouldn't see the need to... Let's well, if issue a subpoena. All right, Mr. Chairman. The, the gentleman, uh, Mr. Solomon, and I did meet with Mr. Conyers informally, and uh, and at that time uh, uh, he offered to come before. But Mr. Solomon wanted this on the record, as he just stated. And, and if I might just say so, Alan, you know, uh, in my 13 years in this Congress, I have never, never asked to have anyone subpoenaed for any reason. You know, I really think that's an infringement, and sometimes we in the Congress, uh, we over act with, with the authority vested in us, and I, I am very much concerned about that. And if I could have gotten him any other way to, to come here and go on the record, again, the entire intent was this. People said, we want to get to the bottom of this because there is a sitting president who might have been involved. And that's what generated this whole thing. GAO has told us that uh, there was nothing to corroborate that whatsoever. They approved he was in this country. Therefore, why go through all of this $20 million expenditure or whatever we're going to go through? And I believe that if Mr. Askin had come here and said on the record that he had no evidence whatsoever to prove, that he did not make those quotes in those articles, and he was totally misquoted, and to have then Mr. Conyers say on the record to us in public what he said to us in private, which he's, he, he says, is that he doesn't believe there's anything to it of this at all. Now, why not come forth in public and say that uh, <coughs> instead of going through this, uh, this charade that we're going up? Uh, well, again, um, I understand. I, mean, I, I understand that the, the need to editorialize on this, but in, in well, terms of. Sorry. In, in terms of getting the information, if Mr. Conyers indicates that he's willing to come to us informally and discuss it with the, with the entire committee, I think the rest of us would like to have the same opportunity that, that you would have. And short of that, and, and until that opportunity, that request has been made, uh, I, I could not in Gentlemen, all good Neil, conscience you, If you want to withhold the markup on this, uh, on this bill tonight, uh, we, we could certainly do that. Withhold the Neil, subpoena, yeah, certainly. Mr. Conyers has said that the GAO report was inconclusive, as was testified here. He said he learned nothing, uh, Mr. Askin learned nothing, and there's nothing to talk about. <laughs> that, that was his conversation. Question comes in the motion, gentlemen from New York, Mr. Solomon. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. 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 The no's appear to have it. The motion's not adopted. Mr. Chairman, uh, with all due respect to the other members, I would ask for a recording. Clerk will call the roll. <laughs> Mr. Derricks. No. Mr. Bielenson? No. Mr. Frost? No. Mr. Bonnier? Mr. Hall? Mr. Wheat? No. Mr. Gordon? No. Ms. Slaughter? No. Mr. Solomon? Yes. Mr. Quillen? Aye. Mr. Dreyer? Aye. Mr. McEwen? Aye. 
Mr. Chairman. No. On this matter, four members have been voting in the affirmative, second, seven in the negative. The, uh, the motion of the gentleman from New York does not carry. Mr. Chairman. Mr. McEwen. Mr. Chairman, from the testimony and my questions, it seems that, that Mr. Oliver was a guiding light in the investigation. And uh, before we proceed any further, it might be good if we could receive the benefits of his uh, observations as well. And I would suggest that he be called, since Mr. Askin is an outside consultant, Mr. Spencer Oliver has proven to be uh, omnipresent and during the discussions, whether it be in members' offices or whether it be at, at uh, government operations committee meetings or whether it be uh, even in the Senate. And so I'm sure he would have not any reluctance to appear before the Rules Committee uh, if we were to request, and I do so. Gentleman, yield. Be pleased to yield. Well, I certainly agree with the gentleman's motion. I think we have difficulty serving him since we can't determine who he works for. Uh, whether he works for the House Foreign Affairs Committee or whether he's uh, on Terry Sanford's uh, uh, payroll over in the Senate. But uh, that's an interesting ethical question about who's, who signs his payroll and who does he work for and where is his desk. But uh, I certainly do support your, uh, your motion. Thank you. Uh, as both gentlemen just spoke, knows that uh, the, uh, the committee entertained the minority's request to to uh, ask any witness to come forward that they wanted. They had their, their opportunity. Today was the day for it. Mr. Waller's name was not included, and therefore uh, uh, the, you, you have one day, and this was it. No, Mr. Chairman, you. Mr. Chairman, I mean, it seems to me I'm, I'm right in the middle of all this. I, mean, I asked the question and found that uh, Mr. Oliver was much more involved than any of us had known before. And while we obviously had today as the date you know, to uh, hear from these witnesses when a new name comes up before we make the conclusion. I think that we clearly should have the opportunity to hear from them. Mr. Chairman, the allegations are a dozen years old. Uh, failing to miss a deadline for a 3 o'clock hearing it shouldn't preempt us from... Mr. from Mr. <laughs> Oliver's name was in the hearing as much as Mr. Askins was. Uh, That's right. That's why we wish to subpoena both of them, if at all possible. Well, you should have done it at the, when you had the opportunity. I do have the opportunity. This is the moment, and I'm making the motion. Question comes in the motion. The gentleman from Ohio, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. No. The no's appear to have it. Mr. Chairman, I think the record should reflect as to what the Clerk record already shows roll. what he did as to who denies him appearing, appearing here. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Derrick. No. Mr. Bielens. No. Mr. Frost. No. Mr. Bond. Mr. Hall. Mr. Wheat. No. Mr. Gordon. No. Ms. Slaughter. Mr. Solomon. Aye. Mr. Quillen. Aye. Mr. Dreyer. Aye. Mr. McEwen. Aye. Mr. Chairman. No. On this matter, six members have not voted in the affirmative. Oh, sorry. Four in the affirmative, six in the negative. The motion is not adopted. <laughs> Any other motions? Mr. Okay. Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Solomon. we do not have uh, uh, any further subpoena motions. Uh, the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. McEwen, who is going to, to manage this legislation, does have several amendments uh, uh, that deal with uh, our Republican leader, Bob Michaels, uh, offering to the Speaker of the House to uh, make this a bipartisan joint effort that we could all participate in. And uh, I would yield to him to... Uh, uh, offer those amendments at this time, if, if, if we are in the amendment pro markup process. Uh, if I may at this time, we've all heard the testimony. We're now prepared to enter the markup stage of the hearing on Resolution H. Res. 258. Uh, it has been before the committee for some time, and I'm sure we're all familiar with its contents. I realize there may be several amendments offered. I believe Mr. Derrick wishes to offer an amendment in the nature of a substitute. And I'll recognize Mr. Derrick first. Other amendments may be offered while the Derrick substitute is pending. So you can offer your amendments to Derrick. I recognize him and then you Yeah, right. Yeah. Thanks. Just one more. Otherwise. Yeah, this is his resolution. Yeah. Fine. Chair will be in the receipt of a motion. Mr. Chairman, I do have a substitute that I wish to offer. The substitute further narrows the scope of the investigation by making two changes. 
from H.R.S. 258. First, the substitute drops subsection F, which would have included all matters directly or indirectly relating to the question. The substitute also changes the phrase to affect the timing of the release to delay the to to delay the release. Let me go over that again. To affect the timing of the release, and it changes it to to delay the release. Too many twos in there. That's all. You've heard the motion, gentlemen, from South Carolina. There are amendments. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have a substitute. Gentlemen, I have it, a substitute. Is this the correct time? Uh, it's a, the Michael substitute, which I think has been passed out, it's House Resolution Number 255. It, it includes the Carter campaign and administration under the scope of the inquiry, as uh, was done in the Senate. It places a six-month deadline on the final report, subject to extension by the House if it chooses to do so. It deletes proxy voting, and it uh, would bring task force under the applicable House rules, procedures, and protections. Uh, Mr. Derrick. Thank you. I would uh, not support uh, that motion for two reasons, basic reasons, uh, there are more, but uh, two basic reasons. One is that no one has suggested any impropriety on behalf of the Carter administration. Mr. Carter was president of the, of the United, United States, States of America. When, this, when this took place. That's right. And he was exercising his constitutional authority. No one has suggested that Mr. Carter uh, did any, uh, con conducted any impropriety. The, the second is, it is the matter of timing. And I think if, if we all listen to the testimony here this afternoon, uh, if there's one thing that came out of it loud and clear is that we don't need any time limit on this, that we need to get to the matter, the, the truth of the matter, if we can get to it in two months, three months, four months, a year, or what Ever it takes to get to the truth of the matter. That is the objective, to get to the truth of the matter, uh, not to put some um, uh, unreal or unrealistic uh, uh, time restraints. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. McEwen. Mr. Chairman, I'm not sure uh, of the relevancy of the suggestion that no one has suggested that Mr. Carter has done something or not done something. Uh, I have found no official uh, claims that, uh, that Mr. Reagan did it either. I mean, we have, these, we have these people who claim to work for the CIA, but that's easily checked, and of course they never did. So we, we have these preposterous allegations out here. Uh, one that we do have is a former Carter employee of the National Security Council says that he did engage in arms for hostages. In fact, he not only plays a part, he says the part that he did, the actual names and figures, and put it in his book. Now, we have heard significant pontification in recent years as to the evil to the Republic and the demise of the Constitution that is threatened by arms for hostages. And for now, to someone to say that uh, he was the President of the United States during the engagement of arms to hostages uh, is certainly a very small fig leaf in my mind. But the whole purpose of the inquiry says this. If we were to believe these folks, what they claim is that Mr. Uh, someone in the Reagan campaign offered $40 million to have them keep the hostages locked up until January of 81. Mr. Carter's national security advisor, who writes his book, is coming out next month and is doing the circuit at the moment, he claims that Mr. Carter offered $150 million. Now, unless one is completely blinded to the inquiry at all and completely prejudiced to the facts, they would have to conclude that if someone had offered $150 million for the hostages, and someone else had offered 40 million to the hostages, that if there is any truth at all, you should look at both, because one has a direct bearing upon the other. And to say that we don't want to look at one because during that moment he was President of the United States shows a prejudice that I think marks the purpose of our meeting here. And we will see if the goal is to get to the facts and find out if the, what the real truth is and what the real uh, story is, or is this a political witch hunt? The vote on whether or not Mr. Carter's arms for hostages request is investigated in the course of this investigation will, will tell the story as to where we go from here. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Dodd. If an employee of the Carter administration were negotiating with the Iranians on Mr. Picardo's half, 
He has every right to do it under the Constitution of this country. The whole purpose of this hearing are allegations that have been made that a campaign, not a duly elected official, as Mr. Carter was at the time, have tried to circumvent an election, have tried to circumvent an election and circumvent the whole, the total electoral process, well, the and possibly in that, pro not until I get through, and, uh, and have possibly uh, uh, caused uh, these people uh, to stay over there a danger to their life and to their, uh, and to their body. Uh, that is what this is about. It's not about uh, a, a president exercising his lawful duties. The gentleman yield. I'd be glad to yield. I, I just wanted to say, as I looked at the Michael substitute as it's been offered here uh, by Mr. McEwen, the first word here is Carter campaign. It says and administration on here, but it says Carter campaign. And well, we know that uh, Jimmy Carter was president of the United States at that point. Maybe there was some relationship between his campaign and these allegations which have been made. And we want to get all of the facts. Those are not the allegations that have been made. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. the executive order that bound all government officials prevented them from engaging in this sort of activity. They have now boldly and with impunity and uh, claimed that they did so. Uh, the purpose of this investigation is to see whether or not someone in the Reagan campaign engaged in a bidding process with those people. And to say that you're going to look at one side and not the other is very, very transparent as to what the purpose of this so-called investigation is. If you're interested in getting at the facts, then you're going to look at both people at the table and who was bidding for whom. And to say you're not going to look at one and you're only going to search the empty nest on the other side is demeaning to the Congress of the United States and the American people that have to. You've heard the motion, gentlemen from Ohio. Question comes on the motion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. 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 Those appear to have it. Absolutely, Mr. Chairman. I need a recorded vote. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Derrick. No. Mr. Bielens. No. Mr. Frost. No. Mr. Bonner. Mr. Hall. Mr. Wheat? No. Mr. Gordon? No. Ms. Slaughter? Mr. Solomon? Yes. Mr. Quillen? Aye. Mr. Black? Aye. Mr. McEwen? Aye. Mr. Chairman? No. On this motion, four members having voted in the affirmative, six in the negative, the motion is not adopted. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Solomon. <clears throat> I was uh, not going to offer any, any motions or amendments, uh, leaving that up to the, to the bill manager on our side of the aisle. But uh, as I listened to the, uh, to the articulate arguments uh, that uh, my good friend, Mr. Derrick, uh, has uh, given us, uh, I'm just wondering then, uh, and based on your uh, statements earlier, Mr. Chairman, where you said that uh, no decision had been made on, on just how we would write this, this bill that uh, mark it up. Uh, why don't we do this? And I would make this as a motion. Why don't we offer the Michael substitute, but exclude the Carter campaign administration under scope of inquiry? Let's exclude it. Now, what does that leave us? That leaves us the things that we were talking about uh, that have been unfair and that uh, your side of the aisle has refused to even negotiate with, uh, with our Republican leader, Bob Michael. So we would exclude the Carter campaign and administration under the scope of the inquiry, but we would place a six-month deadline on the final report, subject to extension by the House, which means if there is need to continue, if there is need to spend more money after we spend all this money during the six months, we can continue. We would delete proxy voting, something we don't have even in this committee. And why should we have proxy voting? We would eliminate one member or staff depositions, two member quorums to close meetings. Only have to have two members present to close a meeting? So we're going to eliminate that. And uh, otherwise bring task force, uh, bring this task force under applicable house rules and procedures and protections. Now what's more fair than that? So let's be fair. 
I offer this motion. We exclude the Carter campaign and administration as, as uh, you wanted to do. And I would move that motion. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Derrick. Object of this investigation, if it goes forward, is to get at the truth of the matter. I think if this testimony here before us this afternoon proved one thing, it proved one thing without question, and that is that there's going to have to be a good little bit of time involved to get to the truth of the matter. My observation of the Iran-Contra hearings was that one of the reasons there were not really conclusions reached on that was that there was an artificial time limit put before they started. And you know, there are all sorts of dilatory tactics that can be used to take that artificial time limit and work to the advantage of those who do not wish possibly to get to the, uh, to, to conclude the matter and, and wanted to, these questions to go uh, unanswered. Uh, so I think it would be very ill-advised to put uh, a time limit on it. Any time that the House wishes to cease the investigation, they can do so by a majority vote. Uh, as to proxy voting, uh, why not have proxy voting? Most committees do. This committee doesn't, but that's an un uh, uh, unusual situation. As far as the staff depositions, all of these things, if you do away with the, uh, if you do away with the way it's set up, most of them, I would consider them to be dilatory tactics. With the gentleman yield. Dilatory tactics. I'd be glad to yield. I, the only thing I say on, on this question of the six-month deadline is if those of us in the minority are in fact responsible for what are described as dilatory <laughs> tactics, trying to prevent this investigation from going ahead, you clearly have the majority vote in this House and you can extend the investigation beyond that six-month time frame very easily. I remember we were uh, originally talking about this, that Ms. Slaughter said, I guess it was last week, that there shouldn't be a time deadline on the truth. I don't believe there should be a time deadline on the truth, but when we have the horrendous expense involved and all of the conflicting reports which have come to us, it seems to me that six months would be an adequate time, and then at the end of that six-month period, I'll tell you, if it hasn't been completed, I'll vote with you to extend it beyond that six-month period. Just seems to me that this is a very balanced approach for us to take. Mr. Chairman, if I may just make, you know, none of us up here trying to, uh, are fooling ourselves, I hope, and we're not trying to fool anybody else. You know, I think this is a very central uh, to this resolution. You can put a six month time limit in there, and anyone who knows what they're doing can kill this investigation for all practical purposes. Uh, you, it, it's not hard to do. I think it is central. I think we need, I think we have to keep in mind why we're here. We're here to get to the truth of the matter. So why put artificial time limits on that? If it takes longer than that to get to the truth, let's do it. If it doesn't take that long, let's do it. But why put this artificial uh, 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 timetable? The only reason I'd say we'd put it on is the fact that we have the opportunity to extend it as soon as we get to that. Well, then, if you have that opportunity, just leave it alone to begin with. Well, why don't we vote? And, uh... Question comes on the gentleman's motion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. <laughs> no. No. The opinion of the chair, the uh, Mr. Chairman, I would ask for a uh, recorded vote on that, please. Gentleman from New York, ask for a recorded vote. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Derrick. No. Mr. Bielson. Mr. Frost. No. All right. Mr. Bonner? All right. Mr. Hall? Well, then we can't do that. Mr. Wheat? No. Mr. Gordon? No. Ms. Slaughter? Mr. Sullivan? Aye. Mr. Clough? Aye. Mr. Dreyer? Aye. Mr. McEwen? Aye. Aye. Mr. Chairman? No. On this matter, four members have been voted in the affirmative, five in the negative. The motion is not adopted. Mr. Chairman, uh, before yielding to the gentleman from uh, Ohio for individual amendments, uh, 
you know, I go back to your original statement in uh, which you said that the majority really wants to cooperate. But uh, I just, I have to point out, because my good friend Mr. Derrick has used terms like dilatory and uh, saying that perhaps we, we Republicans, we in the minority might use dilatory tactics. Uh, I, I hesitate to say this, but, uh, you know, I really have to question the sincerity of your side of the aisle in really <laughs> offering to negotiate and to cooperate. Now, you've already turned down a substitute which included Jimmy Carter. Now you've turned one down that excluded him, but had all of these other, uh, the, the total operations that we operate here in this committee and in the House of Representatives. And now we're going to offer several amendments individually. And I suspect that With you're going to turn them all down. Yes, I'd be glad to yield if, my friend. If, in fact, we confirmed your suspicion that we were going to vote them all down, would you still feel uh, compelled to offer them? Yes, because I really think everybody ought to see it. They ought to know it. We ought to go on the record, as I've been trying to get Mr. Askin up here to go on the record. But, uh, you know, your point's well taken. Uh, would you please offer your amendments, Mr. Yes, Chairman? If I, if I may at this time. Uh, as you know, Mr. Solomon, that there has been much negotiation between the speaker and the minority uh, leader, and some of these things were negotiated out before it got to this this phase of the process. So it's not that this is just coming in from from East uh, Overshoe. I mean, people they have they have looked at this thing. Joe, I have the greatest respect for you, but you look at the speaker's original bill, and you look at Bob Michael's original bill, and there are no changes at all. I mean, no, that's not true. They dropped the tax records. And they, they dropped what? They dropped the tax records, and they dropped any reference to George Bush. Well, <laughs> there was nothing in this bill. Uh, no, but I'm saying. Thing has to do with George Bush. No, I'm, I'm saying that there, there was a meeting, and they did drop three or four things that uh, Mr. Michael wanted dropped. The whole investigation is And that was prior to introducing the resolution. So, I mean, I just don't want it to say that this was well, just printed and, and just put here and jammed down everybody's throat. Yeah. Mr. McEwen. I, I, I have an amendment. Let, let me just say before we start, I understand that people in the Rules Committee have to do bidding, and, and this isn't personal, and we respect your integrity, and, and uh, I think this is basically pretty smelly work, but we're going to go ahead and, and, uh, and, and we've got to plow through this. and. Uh, I think this is going to be a black mark on, on the Congress, which is just about the last thing it needs this year, but nevertheless. Uh, I'm going to take them individually, the, port, the parts of the Republican substitute, including the Carter campaign, six-month deadline, making the rules of the House apply, and uh, cooperating with the Senate so that we don't have to have two gumshoes going to Paris back and forth and all that. We, we can coordinate a little bit, as well as having a bipartisan composition. And I'll yield to the gentleman from New York as to how many recorded votes we have. But at this point, uh, I, would, I would move the uh, second amendment that we have before us, which is to include the Carter campaign uh, within the scope of the inquiry. You've heard the motion of the gentleman from Ohio. Any conversation, any discussion? Uh, Mr. Wheat? Just very briefly point out, it's not the Carter campaign that was involved. We were talking again about the, the President of the United States and the administration. Mr. Chairman, let time. me respond. I don't know who made these allegations. The response, the reason that we don't want to investigate all of the facts is because they said, well, no one's made any allegations. I don't know who made any allegations to start with. And whoever made all these allegations about the Reagan campaign, let me just say I'm making all the allegations about the Carter campaign. So if anybody says we didn't have any allegations, you got them now. Mine are just as fluid, just as responsible, and just as in-depth as the ones that were made about Mr. Reagan. So that handles whether or not there were no allegations. There are now allegations. I submit that the statement by Mr. Sick, the sick man on the Na National Security Council that did the book and said that he made the deal, uh, I believe that that is sufficient information. He even named the figures. That's su sufficient information for them to include them in the scope of the investigation. And so I, uh, my amendment is to include the Carter campaign within the scope of the inquiry, as well as any violations by the administration of the President's executive order, which is before you as amendment number two. Question comes on. Well, I would move the amendment. All right. Question comes on the motion of the gentleman from Ohio. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. 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 The no's appear to have it. The motion Chairman, is not adopted. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Derrick. No. Mr. Bielson. No. Mr. Frost. No. Mr. Bonner. Mr. Hall. Mr. Wheat. No. Mr. Gordon. No. Ms. Slaughter. Mr. Solomon. Aye. Mr. Quillen. Aye. 
Mr. Dreyer. Aye. Mr. McEwen. Aye. Mr. Chairman. No. On this matter, four members have voted in the affirmative, six in the negative. The motion of the gentleman from Ohio is not adopted. Mr. Billinson. I want to say something, if I may. I'm uncomfortable with some of these votes. We're the committee with original jurisdiction, but we had nothing to do, at least most of us, with respect to determining what the procedures would be under which this proposed task force would operate. I believe, I happen to agree only to a very minor extent with some of the suggestions made by our friends on the other side. But I really don't like being in the position where I can't, without messing things up around here, I'm certainly not going to undercut my friend to my right here and others who have been interested in this for a long time who have been heavily involved in it by, you know, voting against their position. But I've, I've been of the opinion from the beginning, as I expressed last week, and I may well be wrong, because I don't know what efforts have been made. I don't know which people have been involved in it. But I really think that some greater effort could have produced some successful results in terms of at least some accommodations to our minority friends' suggestions with respect to procedures. Uh, I don't know if, if uh, you know, we gave way on two or three or four of these things, that they would even support the thing, uh, the, the overall resolution. Uh, frankly, I don't really care that much. I think we do have to show that we mean to be as nonpartisan as possible. I think some of their suggestions have some merit. Uh, as I said, I'm not going to be in the position where I'm going to vote against uh, Mr. Derrick and those who have been working on this thing, but frankly, I'm uncomfortable about this whole situation because if it is a matter of original jurisdiction for us, I wish we all had, had said had had something to do with respect to determining what the what the procedures are going to be. The chairman here. Sure. I'd like to state very definitely that these votes clearly demonstrate that it is a partisan matter. Every Democrat voting one way to exclude Carter, the Republicans voting one way, and the perception of the American people are going to be such that this committee has labeled it a partisan matter. And I think that's, that's not good for the standing of this committee. When we're dealing with what's good for our country, if, in fact, it isn't partisan, what's the objection to having the Carter Campaign Committee in it? I, I certainly think that the investigation should stand on its own. And not, don't let this committee be such a partisan partisan that the American people are going to realize exactly what you're doing. Would, would the gentleman yield? Well, first let me recover my time, if I may, because I don't want anyone to think that my friend Mr. Quillen from Tennessee has been speaking my mind on this. I don't think it is meant to be partisan. Um, I don't happen to agree with him that we should include the Carter thing, looking at the allegations, or recently received allegations from our friend from Ohio about Mr. Carter. Uh, but in all seriousness, I think with respect to some of the procedures, and frankly, even with respect to a timeline, I think it would be useful for us to, in some way, for example, to suggest that they, that they come back to the House after six months with something. Uh, I'm not sure it should end automatically then unless we re-vote it, but I think it's useful in all of these things to, first of all, take it as far away from the election as, as, as is possible. We might be able to. It seems to me I may be totally wrong. As I said before, if, if, if folks on the other side or anywhere else do undertake dilatory tactics, Mr. Hamilton and the other chaps on the majority side are going to say that immediately. And I think they'll shame them into stop doing it because, I mean, it's going to be obvious that they're trying to stop, slow things up so we, they don't hit a six-month deadline. I don't think it should drop dead at the end of, of six months. But I, I, I suspect, sure. But I also do think, as our, as our friend here has said, because I was with him last week when we talked to the GAO people first time and again today, um, I think in a relatively short period of time, once you've hired on a couple of investigators, whatever you're going to do, you look around, you figure out the most important people to talk to, and you can talk to them all and subpoena them all and go see them all within two, three, four months period of time. There's some you won't be able to get to. And if they come back to us or to the House or to themselves, in fact, last week I had Mr. Hyde agree that we didn't have to come back to the House, that the, that the task force itself would make the determination whether or not it would go on so it wouldn't have to come back to a vote of the House. Uh, and, and on top of which, I just think it would be useful to, to tell these chaps, whoever they're going to be, that. We'd like you to do it as quickly as possible. We'd like you to, to aim for six months. Quite obviously, if you can't do it in that time, or there's some loose ends, keep going. Um, and there may be some other way of handling that. But it's, there's nothing wrong with our putting some kind of a timeline on it for them. 
especially if it doesn't really end it automatically at that time. But that may, you know, that may not be useful to you chaps over General there. Hill, and I don't, again, do not, could, could I, uh, I just I, think that, w that one can make some gestures to the other side which don't hurt the investigation, keep it looking and in fact being as nonpartisan as possible, and keeping everybody a little bit happier. Would the gentleman but but I may be making some folks over here unhappy. Well, of course. Gentleman, which did, which um, gentleman are you yield? Did you yield to Mr. Derek? The one to ask you first? <laughs> um, I think my friend from California for his comments. You know, there is a provision in the resolution that calls for a report by the committee back to the Congress by July the 1st. Uh, and uh, I think that should satisfy <coughs> Uh, the minority. We can evaluate it at that time, and if uh, there are those who don't want to go ahead with it, that's the term. But let's put it in a positive sense rather than, than, than in a negative sense. You know, I go back to the Iran-Contra thing. Members who have served on that committee told me that the reason they felt they never got to the truth of the matter you know, it would be, I mean, if you could call up somewhere and get someone to come down here and give you testimony in, uh, in a week or, or a few days, that's one thing. But, but I have been told that sometimes it took three or four months because there, as you know, uh, Tony, you're a lawyer as well, there are all sorts of tactics that you can use to keep from... And you know, what I suggest to you, if there, are, if there are those, and I'm not implying that they're over here on the other side of the committee, but if there are those who do not wish to get this, uh, uh, to, for, for this uh, hearing and, and this investi to go, investigation to go forward, if we put a time limit in there, we are offering them a perfect opportunity to kill this investigation. And, 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 you know, I'm telling you that the people who you respect and I respect have told me that if they had to do the Iran-Contra thing over again, they'd never put a time limit in there because it was used to keep them from getting at the truth of the month. I accept that. And I also, and I also must say, Candor, that I had forgotten momentarily about the requirement for a report back. And that's obviously a helpful kind of thing. And obviously at that time, too, the House make a determination, even if it's not provided for specifically in the, in the uh, resolution here, to keep this going or not. Well, would, would the gentleman yield at this point? Sure. <laughs> of course. <laughs> well, just to respond uh, somewhat to uh, my good friend Butler. Derek, uh, yes, there was no time limit on the Iran-Contra. It is still going on today, four years and $40 million later. But, uh, Tony, I, I really do... to me, not to Butler, because that's... I understand, off, but right. let me get back to what you said, because, uh, you know, you talked about this committee and your subcommittee, as a matter of fact, and yours, Mr. Dreyer. Uh, you know, we, ha we have the responsibility for reforming the rules of the House, and it's kind of ironic that here, with this issue, which is before our jurisdiction, we had nothing to say about it whatsoever. Yet, what do we have pending before us now? The Banking Committee and the Energy and Commerce Committee have thrown in our laps a banking bill, which is not within our jurisdiction, and says, go ahead and write the banking bill. It just doesn't make sense, but... At least we're allowed to write that. <laughs> yeah, feel, the gentleman should feel happy we'll that opportunity. That. But uh, the truth of the matter is, Tony, we really should uh, reform the rules of the House. And one of our amendments that is coming up is going to say that this, uh, this subcommittee or this task force we're, uh, we're putting into effect uh, will uh, make provisions of House rules relating to committee procedures applicable to the task force. And that's, uh, that's the way it should be. But at this point, I will, I will uh, make a motion to uh, make in order the uh, number three on your desk there uh, in front of you. Uh, that places a six-month deadline on the final report subject to extension by vote of the House, which is the way it should be. And uh, I think, Mr. Wheat. Mr. Chairman, I don't want to be dilatory in this, but I don't want to suggest that we are not taking each of these amendments seriously. It's just that we had the opportunity to, to have them all in two different packages before us, and they were voted down at that time. And I, I don't find them any more appealing offered individually than they were 
offered as a package. And in particular, this amendment to put a six-month deadline on, when everyone praised the professionalism of the GAO people who were here earlier today, and they told us that when they inquired into two very narrow matters, that it took them from July until February. And I don't see how realistically we can ask them to, or anyone, to expand the horizons of the inquiry or investigation and give them a shorter time period to do it. it, it you know, if, if that's uh, what we are suggesting, then you know, we shouldn't have an, any inquiry at all because it wouldn't be done seriously. Question comes on the motion. The gentleman from New York. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. 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 Those appear to have it. The motion is not adopted. Mr. Chairman, I have my Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Durk. No. Mr. Bielensen. No. Mr. Frost. No. Mr. Bonner. No. Mr. Hall. Mr. Wheat. No. Mr. Gordon. No. Ms. Slaughter. Mr. Solomon. Aye. Mr. Quillen. Aye. Mr. Dreyer. Aye. Mr. McEwen? Aye. Mr. Chairman? No. On this matter, four members have voted in the affirmative, seven in the negative. The, amendment by, the motion by the gentleman from New York is not uh, carried. Mr. Chairman? Gentleman from Ohio. I would like to briefly move number four. Uh, this amendment would ensure that the task force is subject to the same House rules applicable to other committees that uh, the chairman could not authorize subpoenas and disposition and affidavit testimony would could be taken in closed session without a vote required. A majority quorum would be required to close meetings and hearings as required by the House rules. The purpose of this amendment is to conform the task force to the model resolution as contained in the Rules Committee's guidelines for the establishment of select committees, 1983 committee print to ensure orderly procedures, fairness, and protection of the rights of witnesses. Mr. Chairman, this amendment simply incorporates what we suggested should be done. We are the Committee of Original Jurisdiction. Mr. Oliver, or whoever wrote this resolution, did not include these provisions. And I think that we, as, as the Rules Committee, suggesting for the rest of the Congress that they should abide by it, is an ample ex opportunity for us to lead by example. The gentleman alluded to Mr. Oliver writing this. Well, I, I, I don't know. The, the, the author, I, as I understand it, we are the Committee of Original Jurisdiction. Therefore, we should write it. But yet, when we've made suggested amendments, they said that that wasn't agreed to. So whoever agreed to it decided to not to include the suggestions of the Rules no, Committee you, that the, select committees should abide by the rules. So therefore, I'm attempting to amend in this small area to say that, that the witnesses and the subpoenas and the and the the uh, closed meetings abide and conform by the to the House rules as was suggested by this committee. The gentleman's not trying to say that Mr. Oliver, whose name has been mentioned here, had anything to do with presenting so, this. To result. my knowledge, Mr. Chairman, I have never met Mr. Oliver, and I wouldn't okay. know either way what he does or doesn't do. Okay. Question comes on the motion of the gentleman from Ohio. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. 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 The no's appear to have it. The motion is not adopted. We need to Chairman, I would ask for Clerk recall. will call the roll. Mr. Jarrett? Yes, no. Mr. Bonner? No. Mr. Bonner? No. Which one is it? Mr. Bonner. No. Mr. Bonner. No. Mr. Wheat? No. Mr. Gordon? No. Mr. Slaughter? No. Mr. Solomon? This is the one that applies the rules of the House? Yeah, number four. <laughs> the clerk is calling the roll. Aye. Asking for Aye. Aye. No. Four members have voted in the affirmative. Seven in the negative, one present. The motion of the gentleman from uh, Ohio was not adopted. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment. Mr. Quillen, gentleman <coughs> of Tennessee. Following through on my uh, observation that this is a partisan situation. If this amendment is adopted, it proves that it is bipartisan. Mr. Chairman, I offer an amendment that the bipartisan composition of the task force should be composed of 12 members, six from each major political party in the House. The Ethics Committee is that way. Other committees are that way. Yet, I think if the majority of the Democrats control the uh, task force, that it will be partisan. 
we've had these votes today, and there's no question in my mind of what the perception of the American people are going to be that this is a partisan resolution and the, uh, it is a witch hunt. So I make this motion in the whole that you all will help set the record straight that it is bipartisan. Is the gentleman talking about Article Number Six? Yes. Yes. Okay. You've heard the motion, the gentleman from Tennessee. Any discussion? If not, on the motion. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. 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 The noes appear to have it. The motion is not adopted. Vote, Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Derek. No. Mr. Beamons. No. Mr. Frost. No. Mr. Bonner. No. Mr. Hall. Mr. Wheat. Mr. Gordon? No. Ms. Slaughter? No. Mr. Solomon? Aye. Mr. Quillen? Aye. Mr. Dreyer? Aye. Mr. McEwen? Aye. Mr. Chairman? No. Four well, members having voted in the affirmative, seven in the negative, the motion of the gentleman from uh, Tennessee is not adopted. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Dreyer, gentleman from California. You know, I'm the only member on this side, to my knowledge, who has not yet had the opportunity to offer an amendment to this resolution. So I'd like to seize that chance at this point. And I would like to move that we uh, adopt the uh, amendment, which is uh, called Amendment Number 5. And it requests that we cooperate with the United States Senate as much as possible. Now. Uh, Many people here have discussed the Iran-Contra Committee, and we know that it was a joint House-Senate committee. It still costs $40 million, and there are many people, and we obviously don't want to put a dollar amount on getting to the truth, but we do want to save taxpayer dollars whenever possible. And rather than having people, as Mr. Hyde said in his testimony here, you know, a staff member from the House Committee fly to Paris, and then a staff member of the Senate Committee fly to Paris, to conduct the exact same investigation, it seems to me that they, this amendment simply says that the, it would require, to the maximum extent possible, the task force combine hearings and share staff and information with its Senate counterpart uh, subcommittee. So it seems to me to be a very uh, balanced approach, and uh, it won't in any way jeopardize our goal of getting to the truth. Question: Is there any gentleman from New York, Mr. Solomon? Mr. Chairman, I, uh, I see some staff heads out in the audience sh shaking their heads madly. And, uh, but uh, let me just say to all of you on that side of the aisle, uh, Mr. Solomon, excuse could, me. Could, would you, what, which staff people were One right here. shaking their heads? Right here? Are you in a staff? Yes. Okay. Did, did you shake your head? <laughs> <laughs> was it probably, was, probably. I don't think was, he was swatting flies. Was was it, 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 it may have been affirmative <laughs> in support of my amendment. <laughs> if the inference was is there anything no, that, no, it definitely was going sideways. Oh, was there okay. anything <laughs> that Mr. Dreyer has said that made you shake your head? Yeah. Huh? No, uh, no, 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 the reason that I ask if somehow the inference is that the staff people are sitting out in the audience shaking their head, advising members how to vote, I resent it. Uh, well, uh, now, just a minute, Mr. Wheat. We've been very friendly in this. We, we have been friendly. I happen to look out there and see somebody way. shaking his head now. And uh, I made the comment. It's a sincere comment. I don't think you're swayed by it. The greatest integrity for you. Let me get back to what I was saying. Will you please shake your head the other way this time? <laughs> Thanks. So you're for the, we'll all vote for the amendment. I guess I'm just a little touchy about who's in the audience. I, keep, very I keep looking for this guy, Askin and Oliver and all these people. <laughs> Nobody shows up. But um, seriously, though, you all had talked about, you know, getting the funds together and spending them in the best way possible. This is a real opportunity for you to put the taxpayer's money where your mouth is. Let's save some money, let's use all of our resources, and let's get to the bottom of it. So support the Dreyer Amendment. Any, I move the question. any discussion on the gentleman? Yeah. Yes, Mr. Sorry. Mr. Bielinson. What's wrong with this amendment? May someone, can someone respond to me? Well, the thing that's wrong with it is that uh, it was agreed that we had separate committees. Right. The Senate was going to do theirs, and, and we were going to do theirs. I understand you know, that. If you are uh, joined together, we can't tell the Senate what to do, and the chances are they'll never get a, uh, they might never get a committee going. And we'll never get Yield, did we have anything to do with that agreement that was made? I, I wasn't aware of that. No, but it, we, we may not have. I spoke but, when I used the word agreement. Oh. <laughs> 
No. May I say something, this Mr. Chairman? This was a task force that was established by the Speaker of the House. I understand, I believe I'm correct, that the Senate, the other body, wanted to do it that way and we didn't have much to say about it, right? I understand all that, and obviously there's a limit quite because of that to the extent that we can share things or do things together. As I read this, it says, to the maximum extent possible, the task force shall conduct joint hearings with the Senate counterpart subcommittee and share staff resources and information. Well, you know, to the extent possible. I don't know. I guess if you're talking about sharing staff, that's not going to work. They're not going to, you know, resources and information, obviously. Uh, we were talking last week about yes, but I think what clearly would be done. Exactly what shared. Shared. You know, they clearly would, hopefully they clearly would speak to the, well, the gentleman yielded. same witnesses, especially overseas witnesses at the same time. Well, the gentleman yielded. If you, if you recall the, the question that came during the testimony when I asked Mr. Gherkins if Mr. Oliver, who was a House Foreign Affairs Committee staff member, had been working uh, with any other committee at all, he said that work was already going on with the Senate. So it seems to me that this process of cooperation has already begun in that we have I understand. The, the committees working look, together. The only real problem is I, I mean, I, I apologize to my colleagues on this. And I understand I'm, I don't well, mean to be fine. causing problems. But to the extent that we can accede to some useful suggestions, I think we ought to. Now, you may, one may not be able to have joint hearings, perhaps, if the Senate doesn't agree, but that's up to them. Otherwise, there's no reason why you shouldn't have joint hearings with two or three members from each side if you have a witness in town or something. You may not be able to share staff. You certainly can share some resources and information. I don't it know. It says to the maximum extent. I know. Maximum. I mean, there's no requirement here. It's, it's sort of a sense of Congress. <coughs> yeah. You know, if we get hooked up with the Senate, we'll never be able to get to the bottom. Just that, you know, they can have a filibuster over there or, or, or what have you. You know, that's the problem. I mean, you know, this is a kind of a... I mean, you know, right. these folks know what they're doing. Well, Jamie, you, uh, as I recall uh, Congressman Hamilton's testimony the first day he was here, he said to every extent possible that his intention was to do just that. Uh, I think that, you know, that, that, isn't that Excellent. sufficient? That's not the amendment. That's good. Well, he said, he said as much as possible. He so will you support the amendment then? I don't think the amendment's necessary. We had the word of the chairman who's going to do it. I, we're not amending anything. He's already said he was going to do that. Seems to me. When we, when we have the, the markup for the rules, I think that maybe some of these questions should be sure. asked of the participants. He, he said that right here in front of us, that he was going to do that. So that, that's, uh, I, I certainly believe Mr. Hamilton. I know him to be a man of great honor. It seems to me that it would be great if, as we look at this with the statements that have come from my friend, Mr. Bielenson and Mrs. Slaughter, that it might be nice if those of us in the minority who truly want to see us get to the bottom of the truth might be able to have just one little amendment, which is exactly what the chairman of the committee has already said, adopted by this committee. One little amendment, give us one little sip of water. And what is this thing? Well, Lee Hamilton, who's one of the most highly regarded persons Same. in the United States of America, sat right here in front of us, and he said, to the extent possible, he was going to do this. So is there a problem, then, in voting in support of exactly what he said? I think it's an insult to Mr. Hamilton. We're saying we didn't I, you know, I rather doubt that he'd be offended by our... Well, I'm offended for him. Let me be offended well, for him. Well, that's very nice. Well, I, I think, as I say, I think when we come back, this is just the markup. When it comes back from the House, op, uh, house uh, Operations house Administration Committee, we can ask Mr. Hamilton, who will, I'm sure will be here at the time, uh, if that's his intention. Mr. Chairman, before, so. before we have a vote, could, uh, could I ask a question uh, about perhaps the intent? You did say, and uh, you were speaking for the majority on that side of the aisle too, I know, that, uh, that this was subject to negotiation. We were going to go into a markup, this was four hours ago, and that we could change the, change the bill. Well, we have offered, I think, nine amendments, and there may be one more final. Uh, and you have voted them all down. Now, is that going to be the, the same kind of treatment that we could expect when the, when the Rules Committee meets as a Rules Committee to consider the rule that will put this bill on the floor? Is that going to be an open rule so that the, the House can have open debate and work its will? Or are we going to get the same treatment uh, next week when we, when we adopt the rule? Do you plan to ask for a closed rule? We haven't made any determination of the rule at this time. 
uh, and as you well know that uh, uh, that this committee uh, is just carrying out the wishes of the leadership on this matter that we don't have we didn't have the uh, the input in this matter that we usually have in other matters because this is a, 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 a something that has been discussed between the speaker and the majority leader and uh, a minority leader I'm sorry and I think that we do have another round at it. We, we see what shape it's in when it comes back from the, the Committee on House Administration, then we have another shot at it at the Rules Committee. Now, well, what kind of rule it's going to be, I don't know. You know, I'm just, I'm, uh, <laughs> I get awfully frustrated, you know. Uh, I'm embarrassed uh, to think that, that th this committee is acting as a committee, not as the Rules Committee now. We're marking up a bill. And by golly, no Republican leader can tell me what to do. I'm going to do what I think is best, and I expect every member of this Congress to do the same thing. And now to be sit here and tell us that, well, the leadership's going to come out here with a closed rule, and, uh, and this will be it on the no, floor. I, I just think that's I didn't wrong. mention closed rule at all. I said we have no, we don't know what kind of rule will be forthcoming when we return here to, to, to grant a rule to this bill. Well, Okay, Mr. Chairman, I'll mark my word uh, at the Rules Committee. We're going, to, we're going to see what happens. Question comes on the motion of the patient gentleman from California, Mr. Dreyer. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. 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 The speaker will call the roll. Mr. Dreyer. No. Mr. Bielensen. Present. Mr. Forbes. Present. No. Mr. Bonner. No. Mr. Hall. Mr. Wheat. No. Mr. Gordon? No. Ms. Slaughter? No. Mr. Quill? No, so what about Sol Mr. Solomon? Mr. Solomon. Thank you. Aye. Mr. Quill? Aye. Mr. Dreyer? Aye. Mr. McEwen? Aye. Mr. Chairman? No. The reason he didn't call you, he thought you were out looking for Mr. Askin. Mr. <laughs> <laughs> Askin? On this matter, four members have a vote in the six in the negative, one abstaining. The, the motion, one voting present, uh, the motion is not adopted. Mr. Mr. McEwen. Mr. Chairman, I have one uh, further amendment. It, it's a taxpayer relief amendment. It would go to page 8, line 17, and add the following. The provisions of this resolution shall be effective upon the termination of the office of special counsel Lawrence Walsh, who was appointed, who was appointed in December 19, 1986, to investigate the allegations relating to the so-called Iran-Contra affair. Uh, this amendment would establish the effective date for the task force as contingent upon the termination of the Iran-Contra Special Prosecutor's Office, which has been mentioned is now uh, we're going on approaching the sixth year and $40 million. And before we start on another one of these uh, hunts, I really think that we, we really ought to do only one at a time. And, uh, and w w when two and a half million dollars, the gentleman, Mr. Bielensen, was chairman of the Intelligence Committee, in my opinion, one of the finest members ever to serve here. He doesn't need any accolades from me, but just a very principled man. But nevertheless, our hearing room up there was with nothing to write home about. Mr. Walsh is here, has spent over $2 million just on a room in order to take testimony. Uh, and if we now start into this one, uh, that, was, that was just 1988. Now we're going back to 1979 and 1980. Uh, we're looking at a good decade or so of good healthy spending coming along. And uh, on behalf of the taxpayers, I think we ought to at least close down one hunt before we start another one. Well, Gentleman from South well, Carolina. You know, uh, the Congress didn't appoint Mr. Wallace. He was appointed by the President Reagan. So uh, that, uh, the, the uh, topic uh, here to, isn't about whether or not he was appointed or not appointed. Well, so the question you, is whether or not we start you, on this hunt what again. What you ought to do is call up to the White House and get them to discontinue Mr. Wallace if that's your problem. I really have, I see no relationship between the two here. Well, if you were a taxpayer, you might. Well, I am a taxpayer. Substantial, well, I might add. Glad to hear that. Yeah, we appreciate it. <laughs> Question comes to the most of the gentleman in Ohio. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Aye. No. The no's appear to have it. The motion is not adopted. The uh, question now comes to the gentleman from uh, motion uh, from oh, South Carolina. In the nature of a substitute. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. No. The ayes have it. The, the motion is adopted. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I ask for a roll call. Please. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Derrick. Aye. Mr. Bielinson. Aye. Mr. Frost. Aye. Mr. Bonner. Mr. Hall. Mr. Wheat. Aye. Mr. Gordon. Aye. 
Ms. Slaughter? Aye. Mr. Solomon? No. Mr. Sullivan? No. Mr. Dreyer? No. Mr. McEwen? No. Mr. Chairman? Aye. Mr. Bonner? Mr. Bonner? Mr. Bonner? Mr. Bonner? On this matter, eight members have a vote in the affirmative, four in the negative. The motion is adopted. The rule will be carried. Mr. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Uh, members will have until 9 o'clock tomorrow morning to give us additional uh, supplemental views on this matter, and it will be filed tomorrow. Mr. Chairman, I was just going to call attention. I think another vote might be necessary. Uh, uh, I, I, don't we have to vote on the, uh, on the resolution as amended now? We did. No. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. The gentleman is correct. I just want you to do things right. That's all. Well, I'm trying. Question now comes from the resolution as amended. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. 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 The ayes have it. The motion's adopted. Mr. Chairman? Gentleman from uh, New York. Mr. Uh, Sullivan. Yes, Might I respectfully roll, have a roll. recorded vote? Oh, absolutely. <coughs> Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Garrett? Aye. Mr. Beelins? Aye. Mr. Cross? Aye. Mr. Bonham? Aye. Mr. Hall? Mr. Weed? Aye. Mr. Gordon? Aye. Ms. Slaughter? Aye. Mr. Solomon? No. Mr. Tosh? No. Mr. Grimer? No. Mr. McEwen? No. Mr. Chairman? Aye. On this matter, eight members have a vote in the affirmative, four in the negative. The motion is adopted. Mr. Chairman? The gentleman from New York, Mr. Solomon. I wonder if you could just enlighten the membership as to the uh, what happens now. Uh, Understand that this bill has sequential referral to the House administration. House administration. Uh, do we have any kind of time uh, schedule about when they might act and when we might uh, have a public hearing on the rule on this bill that we've just marked up? Yeah, we don't know how long they're going to meet. Uh, and we don't know how long the sequential is, and so we don't know when we'll have it before us before the, the rule. Mr. Frost. Uh, as a member of the committee. Let me advise Mr. Solomon that as the only member of this committee who also serves on House Administration, I'm anxiously awaiting the bill's arrival at House Administration. <laughs> so I guess we really can't be enlightened as far as some kind of time schedule. I'm sure that the chairman of the House Administration Committee will advise us promptly of what his plans are. I thank the gentleman for his input. <laughs> All right. The uh, committee will probably be very happy to hear that we, we don't have any committee hearing tomorrow. Oh, well. Uh, the gentleman from South Carolina will carry the uh, bill for No, no, it's not a rule. I'm uh, uh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the committee is Thank you for your patience. I'll tell you. Hey, Jared. Yeah. That concludes this hearing of the House Rules Committee. The committee plans to hold a third hearing to plan the investigation of the so-called October surprise. The C-SPAN networks will provide coverage of that hearing, which will take place next week. A programming note to tune to C-SPAN on Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, 5 p.m. on the West Coast, for this week's Book Notes program. Author Tina Rosenberg will discuss her book, Children of Cain, Violence and the Violent in Latin America. That's Book Notes, Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, 5 p.m. Pacific. C-SPAN, the cable satellite public affairs network, and its companion network, C-SPAN 2, are privately funded to serve the public by America's cable television company.